This program was recorded on Monday, May the 18th, in the year of our Lord 2015. The opinions expressed by the participants in the following program do not necessarily represent that of this station or its management. Or anybody else. <laughs> From the John DeVita Recording Studio, located in an undisclosed and clandestine location on the great northwest side of our fair city of Chicago, we once again are pleased to be presenting yet another edition of our monthly round table panel discussion show, Meet the Chicago Historians. Now here's the guy who started it all, filling in, no, I'm sorry, here's the guy who started it all, John DeVita. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Rich. From the John DeVita Broadcast Center, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another broadcast of Meet the Chicago Historians on the Windy City Hometown Thank Entertainment you. Network on Monday, May the 18th, the year of our Lord, 2015. The panel today will be talking about the SS Eastland disaster and other disasters in Chicago and, of course, much more. Yeah, you do, yeah. So sit back and enjoy Meet the Chicago Historians. And now to start today's broadcast, here's our announcer, Mr. Richard Lang. And now here's today's panel moderator, John S. Kacholko. John? <laughs> Well, thank you, Rich, and welcome to our Meet the Chicago Historians broadcast for the month of May. I'm filling in for the uh, the regular voice you hear at this microphone uh, every other month, which is Jack Red Ryan, and I trust that that nickname Red has to do with his hair color and not his political views. <laughs> so knowing him pretty well, I think that's a safe bet to make. But we're here in the, the, uh, the fabulous... John DeVita Broadcast Center, uh, as you heard from our announcer, and we'll be with you for uh, some time today talking about uh, the news of the day, the news of the week, and the history affecting the city of Chicago, the county of Cook, the state of Illinois, the Midwest, and the U.S. of A. So we've got plenty of territory to cover. Before we uh, get into the actual discussion for today's program, let's, let's hear an introduction of those who are on our panel today and I'll start with the gentleman seated right directly across from me at the radio table. Uh, good morning my name is Al Opitz I'm uh, former president of the Austin Urban Community Council and right now we're have a memorial park over there on the corner of uh, Belle Plaine and uh, Nina. So if you ever want to go and see what happened years ago this is the place to go. Thank you, Al. Uh, Ken Little, uh, retired from the Maine Fire Alarm Office. Also, I taught Chicago history at uh, Wright College. And Bill Kugelman, I'm retired from the Chicago Fire Department. Uh, and uh, uh, also the uh, Fire Museum of Greater Chicago, of which we will have... Uh, an announcement uh, later on in the program and uh, uh, glad to be here uh, and John do you know when uh, Ryan will be uh, out of jail uh, <laughs> you know wouldn't he be on uh, parole or what? you mean you mean Jack Ryan our our host or? yes I, my understanding is he was we weren't uh, supposed to disclose the reason why he's not here I mean, you know he had really hoped that he could have kept all of that kind of secret oh, so well, you kind of blown the you kind of blown the whole the whole I, I spilled the beans. he might be here next month under guard and with shackles yeah. on but that but he, he he his last words as he was being dragged away were they can't <laughs> prove nothing <laughs> <laughs> well, when he has that monitor on his leg, why uh, he can he can still be here. So, Jack, if you can hear all, all of this, <laughs> you may you may be rushing back to get to the microphone before your name is is further besmirched. And now let's have our announcer give give us a, a bit about uh, his background. Hi, I'm your announcer, Rich Lang. I've done teaching, and I've been a student of modern American and European history, and more recently, a student at Ken Little's history class on Chicago history at Wright College. Ba -ba -ba -ba. So. Yeah. Very good. And I'm glad you taught at the Wright College. It would be a problem if you had taught at the oh, wrong, wrong college. college. Yeah. <laughs> then, then. I taught wrong things at the Wright College. 
And what about you, John? And I'm John Escachoco, sitting in for Jack Red Ryan, who is uh, somewhere in an unknown and undisclosed location right at this moment. Uh, I served in, in government and politics for many years in the town of Cicero. I was a town trustee and then town assessor. And I served a term down in the Illinois General Assembly as, as a member of the House of Representatives. And became involved with, uh, with radio broadcasting. Uh, well, through the years I did some radio, but then I was fortunate enough to be on the old WJJG radio station where uh, John DeVito was the station manager and I uh, had a chance I had a chance to, to serve as a co-host and then sort of an alternating host with uh, my very good friend the late state senator and then state treasurer and controller Judy Barr Topinka mm. who brought me on as a guest one day and then a couple of weeks later asked me if I wanted to be an alternate host on her show and from there I had a chance to do other programs on the old WJJG and I think everyone here had a connection with WJJG yeah. Yeah. through John DeVita, through the, the good old days when that was a very fine broadcasting center. I think they call it Chicago's hometown station. I think that was that the uh, right. tagline that, uh, that was used over there. So that was kind of the origin of my becoming involved with Meet the Chicago Historians. So, and of course, uh, John DeVita, you heard from him earlier. He's, we're here at his broadcast center. So today... Uh, I know Jack usually starts out with some uh, the news of the week, and oh, one, yeah. one item in the news today is that it's inauguration day in the city of uh, Chicago. Yes. Oh, yes, the, yes. Uh, the, the, the WGN this morning. Mayor of the mayor of Chicago is being in, installed into a second term downtown. I believe, I believe President Clinton is supposed nice to be thing. a guest. He's, oh, yes. at, he's there at the yes. ceremony. Uh, Dur Durbin's there. Uh, a lot of the uh, minor guests. Uh, come around that uh, you don't always want to see huh. <laughs> was governor rauner there i just wondered. i didn't see him i didn't see mentioned. uh what's the other senator's name kirk kirk mark kirk. Kirk. Didn't know he wasn't there either there. uh mostly because it's you know all democrats and uh, so i wonder if there were any republicans in the, in the audience I, I doubt know. it. Yeah. I really doubt but it. but anyways yeah. uh, i got a photo <laughs> i just found a photograph last night of me with uh uh judy barr Mm. At a convention, I think it was. She looked good at that time, you know. She always looked good. Yeah, yeah. she had. She yeah. was a character, there's no doubt yeah. about it. Oh, yeah, she, she, she yeah. was a, col a colorful figure in state oh, politics. Yes. Oh yeah. Well, she was a down-to-earth person. Yeah. Uh, and she let you know to begin too. with. She was, yeah. <laughs> she was outspoken. She spoke yeah. her mind. She didn't speak in political gobbledygook the way so many people yeah. in government do. Gee, I wonder how much money Clinton made. Uh, well, they, for they, this visit today, is he, getting, is he getting a fee for attending? I don't know. Yeah, the inauguration. Let's, let's hope he doesn't give a talk. <laughs> does he get a half a million or a million uh, dollars? Million dollars. Oh, well, yeah. he's, they just came out with statements. He, would, uh, fan, he and Hillary are worth over ten million dollars. Oh, they're oh they're worth Where? way like way more. they're worth yeah. like a hundred and fifty million dollars. Is that what it is? It's like a hundred and fifty million dollars. Okay. Foundation, right? No, maybe they got the wrong person with the ten million. But that anyway. was last week they made. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was last yeah, week. It was, it was, it was just last, last week. You know they always talk about the rich Republicans. I said, oh, you got the Kennedys and you got Clintons and a few other people that are you know we'll have a penny draw for them one of these days. Yeah. They had the Clinton, what what do they call it? The Clinton Foundation, Foundation, Foundation which is no more than just a a well that they uh, hmm. a bottomless well of money for them. Well, the president, President Clinton, said they have to pay their bills. Yeah, you know, they right. Got, they well, got to yeah. keep yeah. getting. Gee, money. even Trump uh, d said that he donated to him, and now he's a little upset that uh, he doesn't like the way his money was spent. Oh, um, well, uh, Donald is uh, really, they sold out the uh, city club, which was the, the uh, they, they sold out the seating in 15 minutes, they said, when they announced Trump was there. Oh. He's oh. one of the, uh, one of the. Is the guest speaker? Well, he's one of the guest speakers all over the country that really fills the oh, room. Oh, yeah, he's, he's, he's yeah. a crowd. Yes. People, people yeah. will. will come out to see Donald Trump. I, I, I saw, I went to one meeting one time. It cost you about $100 to get into the meeting and uh, I think it was that executive, uh, insurance executive. No, that's not cheap. Yeah. I no. forgot his name. He was there and he gave a speech and then uh, the, he was a president of uh, Chrysler. 
he, he was there, and he his notes are on a on a card. It's just I think he's got probably seven words on there to tell him what's just next. the key words, just, just an outline. Yeah. Yeah. And he sure. he sit there and speak uh, spoke for an hour without oh, sure. any notes. Oh. You know, yeah. he, he was not a good politician. <laughs> 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 you know, you got to have the the uh, teleprompter, the teleprompter yeah. there, and everything else, and and if. Uh, Obama gets there, he gets the teleprompters. He gets two of them. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if we could hear what Judy Barr would be thinking about our state's fiscal mess right now? Oh, jeez. Yeah. And she would be saying about that. I had, I had a chance to, to spend uh, some time just a couple of weeks ago with, uh, with her son, uh, Joe Topinka Jr., uh-huh. uh, who has he's served in the armed forces, had a, had, a, had a long career in the service. And uh, he, was, he was receiving an award at, at Morton College in Cicero because... Uh, in recognition of Judy, on behalf of Judy, for all of her services. And uh, they have a family endowment. They endowed a scholarship in honor of her mom and dad for students going to Morton College in Cicero. So I had a chance to, to talk with him and uh, to talk about Judy and reminisce about uh, all the years, because I had, I had known Judy for many, many years, going back to when she was a reporter for the Life newspapers. Oh, wow. she, was a, she was a reporter. for When I first met her, I was, I was starting out in politics, and she was a, a reporter and a columnist for the Life newspapers. And I mentioned one of the, I remember she wrote a little, she had, she had something similar to Cups College on, on the weekend. Mm. She would have a column with all little short blurbs, just people that she had seen around uh, Cicero and Berwyn and people that were in the news, political people, business mm-hmm. people, just s- similar to what, what Cups and it did. And she, I remember she wrote about me, and it was the first time I was ever mentioned in, in, in the paper. She said, congrats to John Kachoko. On the youngest fellow in years to be uh, recognized as as future star material in town politics. Wow! Very good. And uh, wow. and I had, I remember thanking her at the time, and I, I mentioned that to Joe, thanking him for you know. She what, had foresight. Yeah, yes, she had yeah. yeah. mm-hmm. given me a plug right at the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, she was like I said, it's a character, and I met her several times in a good way. Yeah. And uh, but you know. <laughs> it's a shame. I mean, she she had had some some health difficulties, but apparently, what happened to her was was it was no one expected this. It isn't as though she was uh, had been ill to the point where where I it was anticipated. This was came as a big surprise. Was I this during think, the last I don't think election? she wanted any sympathy from anybody anyway. She wanted to be on her own, and that was it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, she died in in December. She died right after the November election. She had right, just yeah. been reelected. And it was maybe a month later. It was right at the, like the first week of December. I think she passed away. Yeah. I was at, I was supposed to see her at a at a Christmas function for a charity in town called Seguin uh, for for you know children with disabilities. And uh, they have a Christmas party every year that she would always attend. And and the uh, the fellow who puts it on, Al Carr, who was the county commissioner for a number of years, said Judy. He told me in advance Judy's going to be at the event she had already confirmed that she would be there that saturday the first saturday in december and she didn't attend but joe said it wasn't because she was sick it is he said something just came up at the last minute she couldn't make it and then it was it was the following tuesday i think that she died wow wow but anyways to go go into modern news uh you heard about the waco battle they had down there gun battle Nine killed. motorcycle gangs. Yeah, there was yeah. five. I thought it was just a couple. One hundred and eighty-nine arrested. Yeah, there was. I think five different gangs. Yeah, there. that would have to be a Battle lot of handcuffs. He said there are a n- number of cars <laughs> in the parking lot that are still riddled with bullets in the, in the parking <laughs> lot of this. I wonder if that will uh, will uh, resound up here. We have a lot right. of motorcycle gangs there. Yeah, but they usually seem to be terror in their own territory and that's a uh, friend of mine is uh with the state police and that's his forte is uh his motorcycle gangs always has been yeah, I and remember. Uh, that's not true that they're in there they have they still have a lot of problems with uh, them now i remember the old chicago uh, outlaws and i knew a couple of them they were they were not dangerous at that time now i don't know hmm. you know at that time the uh you talk to the police They'll tell you if they're dangerous or not. Yeah, well, this is how many years ago? 60 years ago? No, not quite. Uh, 50 years ago. <laughs> Are they often involved in drug dealing? Perhaps that's a, Not that I know of. Joe, Joe said that they are involved in anything that will make them money. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, the, the, the headquarters of this unit that 
watches them is up in Elgin. Mm. And uh, he said they picked the right spot for that. That that's that's the one of the center mm. centers of the motorcycle game. Elgin. Oh? Elgin. Uh-huh. Yeah. I didn't know that. I was just in Elgin a few weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. You know, I, I you would, I guess because uh, of the traffic problem, they don't have as much here, but they still have quite a few. The state state police have been told to keep them off the expressways. Well, they said that the uh, one of the gang after after this this riot and gun battle was shut down, one of the one of the gangs supposedly said they they had threatened to shoot at police officers. And I heard today that the chief of the police department said we're ready for him. <laughs> he didn't sound like he was backing down. He, no, they said they the, the, they police, the police department said we're prepared for him. They can't be uh, backed down. They, you know that's that uh, would undermine them all the way. They said that sure. they said when the police arrived, they shut this this gun battle down in a matter of just a few minutes. So they oh, must have really they must have really showed up with force. Because there were and of course, and of course, our president now uh, has uh, cut back issued on a uh, executive order that uh, the police will not be issued any army vehicles or uh, arm, uh, uh, military uh, uh, gear, which uh, really makes a lot of sense. Well, you know, you've got to protect them. But one thing nice about him, though, apparently he's going to leave Chicago when he leaves office. So I make a lot of people in Hyde Park happy because of the fact that right now that's a they're blocked off because they can't go anywhere, you know, within reason of the uh, area there. And uh, he leaves this uh, library, which, even though I'm not a fan of Obama, I, I, I hope that the library creates some business in the area anyway, help I, the area. I do think that. I've heard about all I need to hear about it on the news. I mean, we went through this whole debate as to whether it was going to be in Chicago or not. Now they've decided it's going to be in Chicago. Now there is debate which neighborhood in Chicago. Yeah. So that's going to go on for a few months. Then when they pick the neighborhood, then there will probably be a big debate as to which street it's going to be no, on. No, so this could go on for the next four years. You know, and no, then there will be which block. It's, there will be a big debate over which no, block it's, it's going to be on. It's not the problem what block. It's what park they're going to desecrate. <laughs> <laughs> desecrate, okay. <laughs> well, it's Washington Park and Jackson Park. And they've already Chicago's, got the design. Chicago, yeah, I know. Chicago is short of parks. And, uh, you know, to desecrate another park would be ridiculous. And there are rules as, I, there are rules as to what can and cannot be put in a, I mean, there theoretically are rules. you're not supposed to build anything in a municipal park. There are rules, but then there are politicians. Yeah. You know, the old saying goes, money talks, BS walks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, uh, the, the, the design for this building is quite unique. It's, uh, it looks like an old farm outhouse <laughs> and, and that's just about the way they look. Where did you see the design bill? Was it in any paper? I mean have you seen pictures? Of I, I think I saw it in the uh, WLS. In the Farmer's Journal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's not a milk carton. I think. Yeah. Well, the, other, the other one that's up to our debate yet is the uh, Star Wars Museum that right. they want to put down on lakefront which I have less trouble with because of the fact that it's recovery uh, it's landfill as such, but there are rules and everything else about building a landfill. And of course, the tailgaters don't like it because they can't have a tailgate party inside of the museum. But shouldn't the, shouldn't the Star Wars Museum be on Princess Leia's planet or, or <laughs> on know. the Death Star? I mean, why, I mean, why do they pick Chicago? Well, Chicago, <laughs> uh, they, they went after them and they couldn't get, uh, what was that, the uh, Presidio Park over there where he wanted the original park. The Presidio in San Francisco? Yeah, that's where he wanted it. Oh. And that's a national landmark. And they said no, and there's no place else in San Francisco to build anything because there's essentially packed. Yeah. yeah. They, they can't move uh, any direction because of, of the mountains behind uh, around them. And to go out. In the water. Yeah. Go out west further, you have a little problem called you're going to drown. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I don't think they want to build on uh, Pelican Isle or uh, Alcatraz, and there's really nothing else around there. Tatooine. No. I think that's the name of the planet in Star yeah. Wars. Tatooine. 
but uh, you should have built it there. You, you I, know, I sort of like the idea of uh, Star Wars Museum coming here, but I sort of him and hawing about where they're going to locate and the be. style of it or design of it. On the lakefront, maybe not, but somewhere near the city. You, the city. you know, you know what bothers me? Uh, it isn't. I, I don't like the lakefront because of limited access. You right. know, I'm from the fire department. You know, you can't come in from the east. You only can come in, you know, three ways, and, right. and that jams it you up. And you can't come over the water? No, you know, no. You have, I don't. You, to, you have to go back 2,000 years to get Jesus Christ in here to go and. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah, he, he's not going to do it twice, though. I, I figured that out. Uh, and that's the thing that bothers me. I, for example, like the United Center. You know, United Center, is, to me, is perfectly yeah. located because you can come in from four different directions. You got four main streets, you know, Western, uh, the expressway, et cetera. You know, I don't like to see everything jammed. I know, now we're talking about a casino. You know, well, what's the first thing they think? Well, maybe Navy Pier. Worst place in the world for it. For Christ's sake, you can, well, you can burn it down yeah, 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 and <laughs> kill a whole bunch of people. We're going to probably talk about diesel and disaster, and that happened in yeah, Chicago. Well, you know, and uh, 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 we we could have a, a repeat of that, you know. Well, yeah. What happens when you're on Navy Pier and there's a fire? There's only one way in and one way out. You're not going to be jumping into the water if you Especially are. Especially winter time. Yeah, winter time. And that's the other thing, you know. You mentioned Al you know, about uh, the parks. I agree, but you know, half the year, half of the year, the parks are are uh, are not accessible because of the weather. You know, well, who goes out in the park when it's ten below zero? You know. Did you ever try to go to the Field Museum? There's absolutely no parking around there. Yeah. You know, unless you want to, you know, unless you want to walk. Well, I I've gone there. I don't recall uh, you know any particular. Uh, yeah, there's no parking. Pro pro well, don't they have underground uh, parking there? They have it over by uh, Soldier Field, but that's not available on uh, game days. So the best way to get there is by bus. Yeah. And Before the bus is not service is not the greatest there. Yeah. But the other thing is that they brought up was the Burnham plan, which the Field Museum was built outside of the original Burnham plan plans for the reason that uh, it was not covered, basically. And this museum would not be covered under the Burnham plan either. So it can't use any excuse, but the fact is it was built on landfill, which apparently is not, has its own problems with the fact is that it's controlled by other governmental bodies beside the city of Chicago. Give you an idea how things have changed Chicago. Back in the, the 80s, I think in, even into the, even into the 90s, before they reconfigured the uh, the, the camp, what they call the museum campus now. There was a there was a parking lot just south, excuse me, just north, uh, north of the north entrance in front of the, in front of the Field Museum. And it was free. And if you got there early in the morning, you could generally find a parking place. I would, if you got there 9, 9, 15, 9, 30, you could usually find a parking place. You could park there all day for free. Yeah, that's, that's a long time And ago. yeah, and as I say, that was in, it's not like this is ancient history. It was like 20 years ago, before, just before they, they reconfigured everything. Now, of course, you know, you've got to pay a king's ransom to park a car anywhere in the loop. Well, if you're, if you're uh, going to a uh, Bears game, you have to have reservations. <laughs> You got to have a yearly ticket to park there, and then you got to pay the parking fee. The stupidity of the whole thing was uh, they privatized the parking lot. Now they said the city was losing money in the parking lot. Well, the reason they were losing, they had a lot of free passes to politicians, and then they privatized it. Well, the first thing they stopped was the free passes for the politicians, and they raised the rates and said, "Hey, we're making money." I said, "Duh." <laughs> You know, if you raise the rates and, and kill the free freebies, you're bound to make money. I, I hope you know with the with the uh, your problems, you know that that the, you know that the state and the city are and, and the board of education are looking at maybe some of that, you know, uh, problems et cetera are going to be straightened out. People are going to say, you know, sit down, people like us, you know, and they're going to say, hey, you know, we got to stop this free. Give give away stuff, uh, and if we promise uh, to pay bills, we have to pay bills, you know. And they're not paying, uh, you know. Uh, Judy Bar Topinka, I'm sure, you know, as controller. I didn't realize the authority that she had as controller. She, she, did, did, did there no 
Hell, no, she, no she would, she would uh, actually say, we can't afford this. Yeah. Well, she's not, it's just, yeah. Uh, straight out, bluntly said it and said it's just signing off on this. That's yeah. a foreign concept to most people in government. What do you mean we can't <laughs> afford it? What sure. does afford it have to do? Just spend the money. Just yeah. spend the money, which we what don't do you mean have. We can't afford it. Yeah. It's a very good article. Always raise yeah. taxes. Very good article in the Sun Times today on uh, just what you're talking about. Yeah. Again. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, we've been preaching that for years and years. I know. We, we, we preached it, you know. S same thing goes on with the school system. You got this uh, woman that came in from the East Coast, and uh, I don't know what her credentials were, but the first thing she did was close 50 schools. And they. By are, itself, though, that is not a bad. bad yeah, uh, but. The, uh, may have been justified. It may uh, have been it's justified. It's justified, but the problem comes in that a lot of these places were taken over by charter schools. Now, the pros and cons on charter schools are the fact that they don't have any union, so consequently, they don't have any billing going to the uh, pension as such. Uh, the con right. on that is they could be more selective on their students. No, the, the big problem uh, in that is that they're owned by politicians. Well, that's also true. They, they, they were great contributors yeah. to the politicians, and uh, especially you know, uh, Emmanuel. He has a few friends in there, and they got caught a few times already. Uh, one of the, I forgot what his name was, but the state would not give him any more money because of the fact of all the games he was playing. Well, it, it, I hope it, you're not suggesting that there's a connection between money and Chicago politics. You're, you're no, not, you're not suggesting that. No, the is money in Chicago politics. <laughs> are you saying that, that the teachers that teach in a charter school are not paying into a pension fund? They aren't even unionized. They're not no. union. Yeah, but that's, 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 that's they all, st okay, so that's they're the not. The whole idea of it was to break the union, and second of all, say. Well, were well, they covered then by Social Security? I believe so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, that, that, uh, but the fact is that uh, they would have to go to 401ks or something like that to uh, get a pension as such. Mm -hmm. And they're paid less than the city uh, teachers are. Yeah. They're Who's setting uh, standards for these charter schools? Uh, that's a good question because the fact is they haven't proved them to be any better than the public schools as far as. Uh, this has got to be an example. As far as the quality of education is concerned, like the whole issue there, of there has school board versus a manual. Yeah, that's all. Well, the elected yeah. school board is they would the politicians would lose power. Yeah, and the other thing was that at one time the school board was sort of selective from one area of Chicago, and they would have to hmm. they put a term they would have to put the term limitations in there, and they would have to be uh, uh, by district rather than just a you know, uh, going down to uh, Bridgeport or something like that. Well, I imagine, I imagine Chicago has the only appointed school board in the state because in every other community, and you have, I, I know in, our, in my community, we have a grade school board, a high school board, a community yeah. college, and they're all elected. The college well, the, board, they're the all other elected. The other problem the city, uh, the uh, state has with education is because of the way the constitution is, uh, they have a thousand different uh, districts for school. Well, we have more units of local government than any any other state in the union. We have thousands and thousands of yeah, uh, yeah. units of local government. We're coming up on uh, just about time to take a break. So this is Meet the Chicago Historians from the John DeVita Broadcast Center, and we will be back. Well, friends, now that the warm weather has arrived, it's time to plant your flower and vegetable garden. It's not too late to start planting your flowers and vegetable gardens. And I have just the right place for you to go. Get your flowers and vegetable plants. You can go to Pesky's Flower Gift Shop Garden Center and Greenhouse, which is located at 170 South River Road in Des Plaines, Illinois. Pesky's has a very large selection of flowers, vegetable plants, and much, much more. 
Whatever you need for your flowers or vegetable garden, you can find it at Pesky's. And once again, they are located at 170 South River Road. They are just north of Route 14 or Minor Street and south of Golf Road, which is Route 58 on the west side of River Road. And be sure to stop in and visit their flower and gift shop. Again, Pesky's Flower Gift Shop and Garden Center, located at 170 South River Road in Des Plaines, Illinois. River Road is Route 45, and they are on the north of Route 14 or Minor Street, and south of Golf Road or Route 58. You can call Pesky's at area code 847-299-1300 for more information. Again, that phone number is 847-299-1300, or they're located at 170 South River Road in Des Plaines, Illinois. Our show. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, this is Meet the Chicago Historians. I'm John Escachoco, hosting today, substituting for Jack. Red, but not Bolshevik, Ryan, who is, who is our, our regular host, and we hope he's doing well. And we are here today talking about uh, the news of the day and the news of the week, and we're going to also be talking about a very tragic event in the history of the city of Chicago and of our country, the, the fabled Eastland disaster, which took place a century ago. We're about to celebrate the centenary of that event. But uh, once again, let's go around the table and get an introduction of each of our panelists, starting with Al Opitz. Uh, Al Opitz, uh, again, uh, let's see what else I mean. Oh, a student of Kenny, and uh, all around, uh, whatever. <laughs> I, I discovered uh, Al uh, under a rock. Oh, uh, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> and um, I.O. And uh, the same with uh, Rich Lang uh, and... Um, we had a lot of fun doing the show, and uh, and I call the show the uh, the teaching at Wright College ah. because it was uh, uh, normally people were not allowed when you're in school to uh, participate at your will. You know, you had to put your hand up or you were called on, et cetera, and the teacher had control. Uh, I lost control. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it a free wheeling. <laughs> free wheeling, attaboy, yeah, Rich. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like this program. <laughs> it's like this program, <laughs> right? So it was. It was a lot of fun, and uh, and I fell into it. Really, I'm not an educator, and uh, so, and uh, but I will say uh, I'm sitting next to, to Chief, uh, Hi, Chief Kugelman, and uh, uh, I've known uh, Bill since I don't know. Let's not go in. A no, <laughs> but long, long time. Well, I, I would just say this. Uh, we were talking about Judy Bart Topinka and the way we admire her. I, I have admired uh, Chief uh, Kugelman uh, his whole career. I met him when he was a fireman, when he was driving Squad 11. <laughs> oh, boy. Is that uh, a long time ago? He was driving? Ago. You trust him? You know, him? I've, I've got a, a um, uh, journal from when I was assigned to Squad 11. Yeah, yeah. And looking through there, it's very, very depressing. Oh. Because uh, myself and Joe Brichetto are the only oh, ones yeah. still still, around, only two. still living. Yeah. And uh, I've got Joe's address. I'm, I want to take it over there and show it to him. Yeah. Uh, brings back a lot of memories. and. Uh, yeah. Uh, Happy memories, ha too. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy, did we have a time. Yeah. Knox and Sunnyside. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, all alone. All, yeah, all, all alone. Nobody to bother us, and we had a ball. And uh, It was very unique in having just the squ a squad, which is a fire rescue squad, yeah. alone in a firehouse. Right. They're always quartered with an engine company. And the engine company had, uh, by tradition, the uh, engine officer was always the landlord. So the squad uh, yes. people were, were were basically tenants, and uh, but here the uh, the captain of the squad, you know. Well, my first captain was uh, Otto Fent. Otto Fent, yeah, Otto and Fent. I loved Otto. Oh I, yeah, yeah. His and and he was a a uh, stepbrother of my father's. So 
my mother and my father, of course, knew him. Yeah. And when I was assigned there, I called my mother, uh, who I was living with at that time, and I said, you've got to meet me at Knox and Sunnyside yeah. and bring my gear, yeah. bring my boots and my fire coat and so forth, because I'm working right, yeah. right then. Battalion 13, the main, haul up the squad, the command van. Oh, what about, what about squad, squad 11? <laughs> Give me a box on this uh, vacant building along the Kennedy <laughs> Expressway. <laughs> anyway, let me, let me finish. My mother gets there. She brings my stuff. I'm putting it on the rig. And, of course, she knows Otto. And, and she's also the wife of a fireman, uh, uh, we go back four generations. Yes. She knows the fire yeah. department. We lived in a three flat where there were three firemen. Yeah. And uh, Ma uh, just about gets ready to go. We were having coffee, and of course everybody's in the kitchen, and uh, these are all macho guys. And my mother speaks up and says, "Now Otto." You take care of my boy, <laughs> Billy. <laughs> Billy, yeah. It, she probably, and and uh, well, I didn't live that one down for about a year. And a half. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, I I was the youngest guy there. I wasn't even twenty one yet. Yeah. You know, so uh, and I I can't mention things that happened. No, no, <laughs> they show. But we had a hell of a time. There. Yeah. Oh yeah, I yeah, remember. Yeah, time. yeah. Yeah. They had moved by the time I came into Fireland or the. <laughs> anyway, we digress. Uh, uh, anyway, you, you you know who I am now. Yeah. So now we got Rich. Our, oh, our announcer. I know. Our announcer is Rich Lang, uh, also a student of uh, Ken's Chicago history class and a kind of a freewheeling history buff. <laughs> I was just going to ask. Uh, freewheeling? What is Free, freewheeling. That's, that's my new catchphrase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Did, did you know Stokey Stover? <laughs> sure. Cartoon I remember character. Smokey Stover. <laughs> yeah. He was the one that invented Notary Sojak. <laughs> notary, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know what else? And, and I use this all the time. They always had one uh, medical uh, malady. It was called Logus of the Bogus. <laughs> 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 so so I, I, do, I tell my daughters, you know, if I put too much currency in my wallet that puts pressure on the leg so I only can carry a couple of singles you know so you'll have to help me out when we go shopping you know oh, goes over like a lead balloon yeah like a story about the fellow who had the shortest arms and the deepest pockets <laughs> anyone, that anyone ever knew he never seemed to be able to pay for anything yeah well, you meet a lot of those guys. yeah I remember a story similar to that once I was a salesman he was he was went to convention he always came in after everybody had a drink on the bar <laughs> oh, I says, gee, I'm just going to buy you a round. Yeah. I'll see you later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one time they waited for him to sh and they just waited for him. And said, I was going to buy you a round. He said, yeah, okay, we'll do it. Go take it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he got stuck that time. <laughs> like a the fellow, wa fellow who walks into a bar and says, when I drink, everybody <laughs> drinks. So they all come rushing to the bar and the bartender <laughs> pours all the drinks. And, when and I then pay, the guy said, when I pay, <laughs> everybody <laughs> pays. Yeah. That's a good one. That is a good one. Uh, <laughs> that's an old one. That's yeah. a good one. An old one. My uncle, my uncle used to yeah, tell me that. Do, Oldie do we ever pretty. identify him? I don't know. No. But no. But anyway, that'd be hey, he's going back to, this, uh, to our uh, major problem with too many political organizations or districts in Illinois. Uh, the, the problem comes in again, too, with that the uh, pensions... Chicago pays pensions bill for both the state and the city, and the downstate don't pay any, mm -hmm. really, for pensions on their uh, school staff. Mayor stand. Emanuel frequently makes that point. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And the that's got to change, too. The flip side of that, though, is that uh, the city of Chicago receives an influx of funds from suburban Cook and elsewhere, out of all propor proportion to the amount of money that's generated in the city of Chicago. I know that was always true in the mm -hmm. RTA. They would never give you, on the RTA, they would never give you straightforward answers yeah, as to how much on. money was generated in the city as opposed to how much money was spent in the city. And the city's attitude, off t the city's attitude toward the rest of the state, and this is something that suburban 
legislators yeah, and downstate legislators always resented was the city's attitude was that uh, that it was sort of there to receive funds from everywhere else that the rest of the state was there to provide money to subsidize the Chicago expenditures on everything their parks their well, schools and everything still, else. Still they and they will never give you a real accounting as to where the money comes from and where it's spent well that's always true with any political but the fact is you have too many political uh, too many political districts well that, that goes to be consolidated that goes back to the old state constitution yeah. the old 19th century constitution what it what the old constitution did it was a very rigid document and it provided strict limits for municipalities, townships, school, school districts, as to how much bonded indebtedness they could have. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was, if you reached your ceiling and you couldn't float any more bonds or borrow any more money, you, you spun off a new district. Right. You created a new district that then would have a new cap, and they could go out, and so that's why you wound up with so many little school districts, mosquito abatement districts, yeah. cemetery districts, you know, drainage districts. If you go once you get outside of the metropolitan area, the, the downstate counties are just awash with these little elected boards and districts and, and that when the new constitution came in, they didn't do away with all these. They kept yeah, all these have, districts. Yeah. And yeah. so well, that's, that's why cool. Illinois has thousands and thousands of little separate taxing districts. I, I, well, I would, would like to Diddy wait was in there and he also would allow them to uh, have gambling in Chicago and other things that uh, the town state was able to take care of or provide for. Now that thing's changing, and I'm not sure if I was in the Constitution or not, but uh, it was still, you know. Uh, now gambling is a completely different yeah, issue than any that's any that's going along. It's still politics, though. And I want to see what what happens. When, when they they want to have the suburbanites that work in Chicago pay a tax in Chicago, well, talk about a cluster. Yeah. That I mean, you can just you can just see what's what well, will that, happen. That's also true know. with the transportation system because the uh, right now your your gasoline tax provides uh, a percentage to the uh, uh, public transportation. And the outside of Chicago, they provide half of that amount. And what about all the what about the, all the people from Chicago who work in the suburbs? That's yeah. also true. If, yeah. if the city passes a tax like that, you know that all the communities in the suburbs are going to pass a similar right. tax similar tax on yeah. all the people. Yeah. And the kicker is the city tax. It says that if the individual doesn't pay it, then the company has to pay it. The business has to pay it. Who ever heard of a tax that's voluntary? How many people do you think are going to well, voluntarily uh, pay the mm. tax? Well, it's it's going to be a tax on the on the businesses. Well, the same thing goes on that, that says if you paid bought anything out of the state, you're supposed to pay sales tax on it. When was the last time you inherited anybody paying sales tax on mm. out of state product? You know, not, they said they were going to keep track of that. Now, how? I don't see how you can do that realistically. You know. And the other one was it got everybody says well, we got to raise the gasoline tax. Well, the problem with that is cars become more efficient. Then you got the hybrids and you got the electric cars, and they don't pay their share at all of taxes for the road road tax. You know, of course, the road tax is supposed to be for the improvement of the roads, not necessarily to line the pockets of the politicians. I but I like the the article in today's another in today's Sun Times. I believe it was where where uh, uh, somebody a writer in suggests that the uh, not the motorcycles but the bikes bike riders uh, be registered. Be registered. Oh, yeah. they're, they're going to find a way to tax. And yeah, them. I, I think so too. Exactly. If it moves taxes, I mean, that's you know. That's yeah. Well, it's not only yeah. really that, but these guys don't pay any attention to the road rules either. No. They'll go through red lights. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and get and, 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 and stop for pedestrians. There's a lot no. of them that should be. Uh, well, yeah. I shouldn't say should be killed, but but uh, that that are so very very lucky yeah. that they aren't. That they aren't. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, I, and I a pet peeve of mine: so many bicycles don't even have lights. Yeah, you yeah. Can't yeah. See them after dark. No, yeah. and they no. weave in and out. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's they're on your. It's, it's dangerous it's driving to have to deal with. Yeah, I don't drive at night anymore because bicyclists. You know because. 
they feel they they're they're sort of on their own. They can do whatever they yep. want. Yep. Yeah. Well, as yeah. soon as they get hit by a car, they can't do too much about it. They're a vehicle, yeah. so they have to. It's it's a vehicle t uh, accident. It's not a bicycle versus car. They're a vehicle, and they have to pay for the same rules. And that's they why they should be registered and licensed. Right. Yeah. The other thing was that fair. the big kicker comes in. They said they want to go and put uh, movie camera on their on their. Uh, Helmets, presuming of course they were a helmet, so that they could take photographs of all the occurrences. And the other guy says, "Well, you know that also works against you. If you are wrong, then you know you could you'll suffer the consequences." And all of a sudden, nobody's talking. I wonder, you know, just on the subject. I wonder how rank and file police officers feel about this new push now to put these body cameras. On police officers, the, I, I wonder what the reaction. I, I, I hear something where the, the the reaction is that no, they don't want them. I, that would be my suspicion no. that that's the yeah. case. I wonder how many people. You know, this is something that they've mentioned, but but people often call the police when things are going on that are very unpleasant. And if you have a police officer come to your door, and he's got a camera strapped onto his lapel, are people going to be reluctant to let that officer in? Maybe they don't want. Hmm. Their home and their family, and and uh, you know, to become a matter of public record. Well, and, and I would point. agree with that. No. Well, the, yeah. the other the other problem that comes and in on the internet. The next time you turn around, yep. The other the other problem is that you know you go on it's probably the West Side. They hate the cops, and then they they get into trouble and say, "Where are the cops?" Well, you know, you you shoot at them and everything else. They're reluctant to come in. So consequently, you you have a double-edged blade there that uh, you damn you do, damn you don't. And the same thing with this guy, that 300-pound uh, kid that got shot. He was unarmed. Well, if a kid comes through your window, 300 pounds and with fists, that's as far as I'm concerned, is a deadly weapon. Well, the other thing is that very often the stuff, the, you know, the video you see on television is selective. If the the police officer is interacting with the offender. And there's someone in the in the car that's that's with a little camera. He may not film the part where the offender attacks the police officer, right. or or speaks disrespectfully to the police officer. That may not be on. He may only start filming when the police officer responds to whatever the provocation was. So you don't get the context. You don't get, you don't find out what the provocation was to begin with. You only see the police officer reacting to the confrontation. Well, the other one was this girl got killed by an off-duty <coughs> cop. Now, that should be taken as a incident of a two people involved. In other words, a guy carrying a gun shooting into a crowd. He's <coughs> they consider him a cop, but he's not a cop because he's technically on duty he's 24 off. hours a day. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, he was off duty, right. and consequently, the <laughs> city should not be accountable for what he does off duty. But they are. Mm -hmm. So it gets to be a real ball of wax there trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong on that. They're on duty well, 24 hours, 24 7. That's always the rule. That's, why, that's why they're allowed to carry a firearm Absolutely. 24 hours a day. Right. I realize my my uh, grandson in law is a uh, 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 deputy sheriff and uh, he carries a weapon with him all the time. I've got a one of my personal opinions is I, I would be in favor and, and this idea had, had, has surfaced from time to time I see no problem with allowing military officers to carry firearms off duty if you're if you're trained in, in the use of a handgun I see no problem with yeah. allowing military personnel they're also on duty 24 hours a day you're having attacks on the military you, know, you had that attack down in Texas on a, on a military base yeah. And this rule we have, you know, where, where military personnel are not armed on, on generally on, on, on U.S. soil, we may have to think about that. I, mean, I certainly would have no problem with military personnel we carrying a handgun. Well, we have a concealed carry now. And yeah. I don't know how many but other that, states. That's but that's I think a, it's a blanket that's rule that, poli yeah. that military personnel would, if they're, tr if they're properly trained in the use of a handgun, I don't think enlisted personnel don't customarily learn the use of a handgun but officers do because they carry a sidearm well we do the mm. enlisted personnel do learn a little bit about weapons uh not enough to do much good on it and usually it's rifles not right uh, right that's what i'm not saying sidearms but any any military person any military individual who's trained in the use of a handgun i see no reason why he sh there shouldn't just be a blanket rule that they would be allowed to carry that weapon off 
off the no, base. No, that's right. yeah. You know, I was oh. at, I was at Fort Lewis, and uh, you see, see people marching around there with M1s and all that, and they're not loaded. They're not know? loaded. No, right? yeah, that's you know. I, I remember I was in Spain umpteen years ago, and the cops there carried automatic weapons. Oh sure. Oh, oh in yeah. Europe. Oh yeah, that was for a long. That was customary even before the terrorism began. Oh, this is uh, yeah, with this under. Uh, Franco, probably. Franco, yeah. yeah. And, and the Guardia Civil. They used to call them uh, black hats. They, they, they wore those little hats. Yeah, they yeah. were called the Civil Guard. Yeah, they're, they're called black they, hats. They carried submachine guns. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, and they ca or rifles, too, and which you didn't see that in Chicago. So. I spent uh, two years in the Army in France and Germany, and uh, the French, uh, no guns. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Well, England was the same. Germans, you know. Germans did though. Germans carried fire. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, German police carried guns. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, England was the same way for a long time. Yeah, I think that's changed now, though. Has that changed? I, I wasn't. Sure I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Well, uh, the regular police, you know, the regular beat officers still don't carry a firearm, but they have plenty of trained personnel if needed. You know, they they have like you know. Uh, quick reaction units whenever okay. anything happens. Things have changed yeah. in the last few years. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah I was the there. ordinary Bobby still yeah. doesn't carry mm. a I was gun. there a few years ago, but I don't remember paying any attention to what the cops were doing at the time, so I can't tell you. And uh, most of the people there were generally friendly, uh, so, you know. People, they, they, pretty people traditionally in England had a respect for the, the officer. I'm just going to say, yeah. You did what you were yeah. told just as a matter yeah. of course. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they didn't need they, a gun. They had a theory about it, and it was, it was n not so much uh, of um, confrontation, but to uh, keep the peace, et cetera. They were you know, peace officers. They were yeah, peace no. officers, yeah. you know. And uh, so uh, it's a little different, you yeah, know. Well, if the Chicago in general, up until I, I don't know what administration it was, but every time the administration changed, the police force changed. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You know, I, and that's was one of the problems that came in with the Haymarket uh, disaster there, and the uh, I think the cops were all political at the point. Well, there was a time when all jobs, all poli all government jobs were political. Yeah. When the yeah. president of the United States changed, everybody in the government was out, and then he yeah. brought in. Uh, new that, new yeah, postmasters and clerk, everybody, but they yes. that changed the long, long ago. There was no civil yeah. service. Yeah. In yeah. 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 Well, well, the other problem with, uh, was the fact was that now it's so huge, there's no way in hell they're going to change because you almost have to change the whole economy. When you read about Abraham Lincoln, one of Lincoln's problems was the time he had to spend meeting with what were called office seekers. Politicians, politicians. Yeah. their congressman or their senator or their yeah. governor would send him to Washington with a letter, Dear Mr. President, you know, Joe Dokes here is a good party man, sure. and he deserve, he would like to be deputy assistant postmaster of Paducah County. Yeah. And Lincoln, you know, the president had no, they had no staff. There was no big president. The president had to meet with people that were pestering him for, yeah, it was for also patronage maybe jobs. Maybe there was also no appointment schedule uh, either. They just walked in. That's Maybe yeah. that's where the Chicago aldermen got that idea. It was like yeah. that. I mean, all governments, <laughs> state, local, they were all, everything was like that. Yeah, now everything is, you can't even approach some of these people. You know, because they're uh, high and mighty, and they don't want to talk to the lower class. Hmm. You can approach a lot of uh, businesses, from what I understand. Not that I'm well, looking there, there's such a conglomerate. You know, send I, me an email, you know, yeah. and we'll consider it. it. I talked to a guy years ago. He was the uh, auditor for one of the big corporations. They said there was so much money flowing through. They was just, this is the time we're going to count our years. Uh, Revenue, whatever it was, and then they started a new year, and they, they had no basis. They had no idea how much money they had at the time. They just had to go and st so they stopped the books here, and that was it. And they started a new year, and uh, so it, it, you know the conglomerates are so big now that you know you look at some of them. Uh, was it Kraft Foods split up? Now they got uh, now they're being bought up by Heinz Foods. And Manzella was having their problems or whatever. Hey, Al, I'm laughing. Yeah, that's the way my uh, counting is. Yeah. yeah, we'll stop it right here. Yeah, we, well, we don't know how much. I don't know how much I got. I wait until <laughs> the uh, W 1099s come in, and I'll worry about it. <laughs> you wait. You wait until the uh, the next uh, yeah. pension check comes in. So before we uh, go to a new break, which is coming up soon, I'd like to make. Uh, a little bit of an announcement, I suppose. On the uh, 23rd, 
which is this coming Saturday, we have an open house at the Fire Museum oh. of Greater Chicago, and that's at 5218 Southwestern Avenue, and uh, we'll be open there from 10 to 2. Uh, the Fire Museum on the, uh, oh, what date was that, Ken? Uh, was that the 16th? Was it last Saturday or the Saturday before? The Saturday before. Saturday before we yeah. had a uh, program at the Fire Academy, and the program was on the Eastland disaster, hmm. which we'll cover here we'll after this next, 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 uh, next hour. We're gonna yeah. talk uh, hour. And uh, we had a, a um, uh, representatives from the Eastland Disaster Historical Society. Uh, they came in there. Uh, uh, they are, I suppose you would call it, uh, headquartered in Arlington Heights, Illinois, uh, with the family, and it really went over well. I would say we had yeah. a good... Do you have a good turnout? Yeah, we had yeah. a good turnout. I would say, well, you can fit, you can just fit about 50, 60 people in that yeah. room. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, their presentation was was the best I've was ever best. seen well, you know, of some of the presentations we've had. Yeah. Uh, we ourselves, the, the, the people that are on the board of the Fire Museum, usually run these things. Uh, but and and you know we're not we're not experts at that. Uh, but these people really really knew what they were talking about. Yeah. And they were a um, uh, family of people that uh, died in the Eastland disaster. Yeah. So they have a person uh, personal. Uh, yeah, connection. connection there. Yeah, this, right. Yeah. And this and and yeah. Uh, uh, they they really really were pr very professional about it. Yeah. Uh, but that's uh, uh, our open house is the fourth Saturday of every month from ten to two, fifty two eighteen Southwestern, uh, unless a um, a holiday falls in there. Usually Thanksgiving or Christmas or, Christmas, or whatever. Yeah. You know. Varies. And then and then uh, you just have to contact us it's usually the yeah. Saturday before uh, you, you, that you know chief uh, that idea of having the uh, presentation at the Academy that that's a plus oh that's absolutely. there is no charge yeah you know anybody can come but but if you're a member you're going to be notified you know so you know what is uh, is being presented and when yeah. and where and it's it gets you you know it's it's a Saturday you get you down in the middle of the city and, and invariably you meet people good you know, parking good parking yeah good parking and, uh, and uh, you meet and you socialize with people that maybe you don't see very often right. so it's a uh, it's a wonderful thing and uh, and it's all taped so it can be um, shown to the you know candidates or or other firemen right. you know as part of their instruction too and. Uh, no, sure. it's a it's a good thing. We just don't get the word out to the public, you know, like yeah. we're trying to do here, of course, and uh, uh, to get more people down there. Yeah. If we do, we go to a bigger room. That's all. Yeah. So, right. You know. Yeah. Have you ever try something like WGN as a public service? Oh, house? we have. We have. Uh, yeah. Don't work. Uh, yeah. We're we're just uh, you know the uh, the last one on the list. That's, that's how about how about them. WTTW? I uh, w through my w when I was president of the union, I still got all of those connections, yeah. and it, it, I, and I blasted out uh, to to all of these uh, all of these people and that. But, uh, did they, did they one of these days, we'll we'll get up there. Uh, uh, we we've uh, we've got uh, the first floor pretty much done. Yeah. And we're working on the second floor, uh, which will house the Ken Little 
uh, oh. library up there. <laughs> Very good. Ah. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to charge too. Uh, by the way, I'll let you know right <laughs> off the bat, uh, you know, a little, little to, uh, to confirm <laughs> or to. What do you got? Four books. <laughs> to uh, confirm. Uh, with yeah, the that's that's, <laughs> that's what, you, what we're going to start out with the four <laughs> books. Yeah. yeah. The uh, literally ADA, the uh, Disabilities <laughs> Act. Uh, to comply with that, we're going to have to have a. Uh, elevator possibly a uh, a chair one of these chairs that takes you up there uh -huh. and uh, Ken said he's going to run that and uh, yeah you know. yeah okay, okay we'll be back you've been listening to meet the Chicago historians and we thank you Real for good. it we'll be right back Chicago historians. Yeah, Chicago I didn't tell Friends, are you looking for a place to have some printing done? Well, I have the right place for you to go, and that is the printing store in Oak Park, Illinois. Call or see Phil Berry at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. Phil will sit down with you and help you plan whatever you need printed. Now his products are brochures, booklets, business cards, catalogs, envelopes, letterheads, flyers, invitations, newsletters, notepads, menus, mailers, manuals, labels, posters, postcards, price lists, NCR forms, cell sheets, table tents, pocket folders, and presentation forms. And his services include one to four color offset printing, digital copying, high speed copying, graphic designs, typesetting, laminating, foil stamping, die cutting, and imprinting. And he also has a complete binary service which includes booklets, cutting, scoring, folding, numbering, padding, and drilling. So once again, for all your printing needs, See or call Phil Berry at the printing store at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, Illinois, or call 708-383-3638. And once again, they are located at Madison Street and Clarence Avenue, just east of Oak Park Avenue. And it's at 621 Madison Street in Oak Park, or call 708-383-3638. And ask to speak to. Well, friends, now that the warm weather has arrived, you plant your. Now back to our show. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're here once again for our May edition of Meet the Chicago Historians here at the John DeVita Broadcast Center on our. Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network. We'd like to thank John Sikanda, the executive producer of our show, through Ridgewood High School, uh, 89.7 WRHS in the great community of Norwich. And I'm here again with Al Obitz, with Ken Little, with Bill Kugelman, and Rich Lang. I'm John Escachoco, substituting for Jack Red Ryan, uh, our regular host. And we're observing uh, a number of anniversaries uh, in, in the history of our country today, and uh, appropriate is to think back just three years ago, we marked the, the 100th anniversary of the tragic sinking of the RMS Titanic, an event that has been remembered in books and in motion pictures and in documentaries, and everyone is familiar with so many of the stories of the Titanic, which struck an iceberg on the, the evening of April the 14th, 1912, sank at about 2.20 in the morning on April the 15th uh, with the loss of, of approximately 1,500 souls uh, with about uh, uh, 800 survivors of the Titanic. Uh, just this past a few weeks ago on May the 7th, very little attention, very little recognition was given to the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the, uh, the RMS Lusitania. Yeah. The Lusitania was the great uh, 
transatlantic rival of the Titanic. They were owned by competing companies. Titanic, as most people know, sailed for the White Star Line, and the Lusitania was owned by Cunard, and they were the uh, the two great uh, uh, vessels uh, on the, the North Atlantic traffic at that time. And, of course, by 1915, the world was at war. The conflict we know as the First World War. It was uh, still early in the war, less than a year had elapsed. The war had begun in the previous August of 1914, and, and the Lusitania was struck by a torpedo uh, off the coast of Great Britain on May the 7th, 1915, with the loss of 1,198 dead, of whom 128 were Americans aboard the Lusitania. Uh, if you've ever seen the motion picture Yankee Doodle Dandy, you know that it's a big part of the film when the newsboy drops the newspapers down, Lusitania sunk. Yeah. They kind of give you the impression that we went to war the next day. That no. uh, that no. uh, it took over a year. That uh, no, it took two, it took years. two years. Two years. It, it wasn't the Pearl Harbor of the First World War for the United States, but it didn't. It did harden America's feeling mm -hmm. against Germany because so many Americans had died, and because it was a civilian ship, it was a merchant ship, a, a passenger liner, and such a well-known passenger liner. And also it's had a lot of contraband aboard it. But, uh, yeah. but the fact that, you know, that be that as it may, people weren't accustomed in 1915 to the idea of innocent civilians being yeah. killed in such, such large numbers. So the idea of more than a 1,000 people dying by the action of a German U-boat, it was the U-20, by the way. U-boats were a, a new development, so it had a low number. There had, it was only the 20th U-boat, the U-20, that, that sank the Lusitania. And it was, it was uh, considered to be a great achievement in, in war-torn Germany. Germany had been blockaded by Britain. There was a sense that this was a way of revenge on the British. But, but uh, as I say, there were, there were nearly uh, there were over 1,100, nearly 1,200 who died. And in that same year of 1915, on July the 24th, we had our own tragic maritime disaster right here uh, within, the, within the, the boundaries of the city of Chicago. Uh, and that, of course, is the, uh, the fabled uh, Eastland. The Eastland was a uh, sort of a, a cruise vessel, sort of a, a Lake Michigan version of the love boat, you might say. It was an excursion boat. And it was taking uh, passengers, many of them from my hometown, many of them from my town of Cicero, uh, from the Western Electric Plant, the enormous Western Electric Plant, which was a relatively new uh, industrial combine at that time. It had been built in the early years of the century. And these were uh, employees of Western Electric and their families who were going out for an outing across the lake, picnic. And uh, it capsized right here uh, on the Chicago River. There were 812, is a, from the number. sometimes the numbers tend to fluctuate on all of these maritime disasters, and they vary. But I've seen that uh, there were roughly 2,500 2, passengers aboard the Eastland, of whom 812 died. Eight, 844. Eight, 844, yeah. yeah. You see vari yeah. variations yeah. on the, the numbers. The problem with that was a lot of people disappeared, and they were never accounted for. Right. Another one was the fact that some of the dead were taken by the families, and they were never accounted for. Yeah. So That's why the numbers yeah. tend yeah. to fluctuate. Yeah. You so see the real. same thing with the Titanic. They, 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 they vary as to how many actually died. Uh, the numbers on Lusitania are usually pretty firm. I haven't seen a lot of well, variation. Well, one one, one of the things with, with this, one of the disastrous things, was it was only in 20 feet of water right. in, yeah. the, in the Chicago River. The story yeah. is that it, it listed to yeah. starboard, and then it righted itself, then it listed to port and rolled over. Well, the, the problem with the, to some degree, it had relation to the uh, sink of the Titanic and the fact that they wanted more. There were a lot of icebergs on, on the, no, on the no, river they, at that they, time. They wanted more lifeboats Life on boats, it. Yeah. And they also, for some reason or other, they put a concrete top deck on that thing. Yeah, it was top heavy. And the story I've heard in the past was it was never what they call, it was always called a bad luck ship since it was built. And because of the high uh, weight on the top deck, it didn't really have much stability. And the ballast they would have had to keep it right would have probably scraped the bottom of the Chicago River. So you, you were damned you do, damned you don't. The legend is that all the people rushed to one side of the boat in order to wave goodbye, like the, like the love boat sailing and Captain Steubing's right. up their way. 
But uh, no. from what I've heard, it was more of a problem with the ballast. It was more a problem the way the ship it was seems constructed. Seems to be what it is. Yeah, yeah. 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 the ballast. Uh, the, yeah, ballast is to keep. In case people don't know, ballast is used to keep the ship upright. And usually the old uh, sailing ships used to have rocks down there and all kinds of stuff to keep the sure. uh, ship upright because you had sails and it was always top heavy. Uh, if you ever heard the story about the Wasa, which was a, a Swedish ship, uh, it was a, a similar to it. The fact was that at that time everybody had to have a grander ship than the uh, uh, neighboring kingdom. Right. So consequently, the sh Ship designer designed it. I forgot how many decks were on there, but one less deck, and the king wanted one more deck on it. And the designer tried to protest, but the king, you know, you don't protest against the king type of thing. And it was top heavy, so when it came out, the first sailing, it rocked a little bit. The gun ports at the bottom were open, water poured in, and just sunk. And when I they saw Yosemite Sam launching a ship like that <laughs> in a Bugs Bunny cartoon where yeah. it sails right into the water and sinks. And, well, and it never, well, never surfaces. I, I killed quite a few people, quite a few uh, men aboard, and they resurrected it. If you ever want to see the ship, they have a museum in Stockholm, Sweden. The Vasa. Yeah. The Vasa. And it's quite a sight to see, and they're trying to restore it, and they seem to have problems with woodworms. So I'm not sure what the story on that was. The Vasa was the name of the royal family in Sweden. It at also that time. means uh, wheat. Hmm. So that's why you have uh, Ken, sprouts of wheats on there. The the uh, we we brought this up at the uh, museum's event at, at the academy in the Eastland. Uh, this happened in uh, 1915. How many? Well, they call them just rescue squads that we have at that time. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. What had happened, in fact, I sent some um, <laughs> material down with my son Phil uh, to the, uh, I uh, uh, have to repeat here, uh, while the Eastland people also uh, had given the uh, presentation to Academy, they uh, uh, have been giving this talk and I was telling the chief, uh, like the North Riverside uh, Library, and so uh, we've we've had people uh, sort of preview the whole thing, you know, and et cetera. What had happened was in 1915, the fire department, Chicago Fire Department, for the most part, was completely horse-drawn. Hmm. There were very, very few uh, motorized apparatus because of the time, but we did have three. And the fire department just calls them squads, and if you don't know what a squad is, you, it's, it's, it's probably a poor term. What it is, it's a manpower squad. Right. And, and it's to provide manpower for uh, whatever needs to be done at a fire, whether it's a, a take a second hose line off, to raise ladders, to rescue, ventilation, you know, opening windows, roofs, etc. All around yeah. work. Yeah. They were motorized. We had three of them. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and so uh, it, 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 the other thing we don't know, I checked, I have a 1915 fire department annual report. The Eastland disaster is not mentioned in there at all. No, not at not. all. My God. In the general orders, which came out every month, uh, there were 51 honorable mentions uh, assigned and uh, given to individuals in the fire department, and they're mentioned. Their their assignments and uh, and uh, their rank, uh, but other than that, as as being at the as being uh, yeah as as making uh, uh, so there were rescue. fire firemen that were active and were involved but in the rescue yes uh, yes right but, uh, but the incident didn't make it into the no the incident itself didn't no make it and into and as a result uh, John we don't have a record of uh, the response uh, or a written record of. Uh, 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 yeah, and what and what each one did, like they would if if there was an extra alarm fire today. If there's an extra alarm fire, each unit has to submit a report of what they did and what they um, uh, what they were ordered to do and what what they did, what hydrant they took, what ladders they raised, etc. Would the fact that it's not specifically mentioned be because it wasn't a fire? Because yes, it was I think so. Yeah, yeah. 
and at that time I've done some research on it and uh, I sent uh, some as I said some material down there at that time uh, the uh, what is now Wacker Drive was known as South Water Street and it was a fire trap the whole hmm. area from State Street all the way curving around to Lake Street was old buildings that had been built after the Chicago fire in the 1870s and they were loaded with produce and uh, uh, like the South Water Market yeah, yeah and it, yeah which which replaced it and now has been replaced itself so uh, and it, and it was not when Chicago was a small town back in the 1830s and 40s it was it was it made sense to have it right downtown but not not in the you know and so eventually it was all replaced. There was a fire alarm box at South Water and Clark Street, Box 16, and we think it was pulled. Now there was a fairly heavy response by the fire department. They had four land engines, the fireboat, engine 37, because it was adjacent to the river, two hook and ladders, the squad, a couple of chiefs responded, etc. But we don't think they ever sounded an extra alarm on it, and that answers your question John <coughs> and they did uh, we know they they called for us a a, uh, a uh, third hook and ladder and what the fire department did they dropped ladders into the uh, river so that divers and rescuers could go down the ladders I mean the boat is capsized but how do you how do you approach the boat how do you get on the boat yeah. you know yeah. that's the same thing was happening a couple of years ago over in Italy with the uh, that cruise ship. That cruise, cruise ship. Uh, yeah. Concordia. Yeah, well, he's in jail. Costa Concordia. Yeah. 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 Although the, that was like a sort of stupidity. Yeah. But then again, the other one was not the brightest thing either. Yeah. But the well, other thing was what, on the uh, what rescue. What I'm trying to bring up, Ken, is is there were no acetylene torches. No, no and that was that was the that was, the, o that was yeah. the other thing, well, there John. There was well, the story that I've, I'm familiar. With, there were welders working on construction projects in and around where yeah. this happened, and there were welders who came to the Eastland and began to to drill holes into the hull of the ship. Yeah. The ship's now reversed; it's upside it's down. Up, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so they were to try to. They knew there were people trapped inside, and the story yeah. is that the captain of the ship was walking up and down the top of this hull chasing these welders right, off because he didn't want them putting yeah. holes into his yeah, boat damaging yeah because he was afraid he was going to get in trouble with the owners of of the boat if they were to cut holes in it and render it well, unseaworthy that's, that's, yeah. that's the point i'm trying to make john is that is that yes it seems to be that that is the truth you know yeah. that that mm -hmm. did happen uh, yeah, pretty, and, he, he and those welders were there yeah. with their torches because the fire department didn't have any. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that that these then guys just happened mm -hmm. to be nearby yeah. doing yeah. construction work. And right? that was great. You know, that was good. And I think uh, the captain uh, was ultimately arrested. I think the police. I think he arrested was arrested. Yeah, yeah. yeah. was charged, yeah. but yeah. not. Yeah. Uh, they were charged. Yeah. But the other yeah. thing was that it was a pretty good sized hole they cut in the hole and uh, into the. Uh, they had several holes on there, and 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 that brought us the Chicago Fire Department. Uh, to the squads with uh, th that they issued us acetylene torches. Oh. Yes. And, and to this day, we still have Is them. that right? We, yeah. Yes, every squad had uh, a torch. On One it. of the other things, too, is that the at that time, the fire department shops was uh, at what today would be 728 uh, uh, West Vernon Park Place, which doesn't exist because it expressway it would be around Polk and Halstead. They did have a welder there. And we think he might have responded because they did have some motorized vehicles. But to, to get to answer your question, the very next year, 1916, the uh, squad apparatus was uh, changed and they bought three new white rigs and they carried acetylene torches. They also carried a, um, uh, a, uh, a what later be called a pull motor or a lung motor. motor yeah. Yeah, to that yeah. That's what they were. No, uh, yeah. What they were called. It's yeah. what they were called. They were even listed yeah. in in the phone book that way. Pull motor, and uh, they started to respond. The squad started to respond alone uh, to uh, situations where people, for one reason or another, had difficulty breathing because of either a heart attack, a drowning, uh, too much smoke at a fire, etc. And by 1919, the 
original three squads had been increased to ten and uh, we had ten squads up until after um, uh, World War II and Bill mentioned he was on squad 11 they were organizing 46 we eventually organized three more squads etc but the problem that they had uh, I shouldn't say a problem but one of their they had two tasks one to provide extra manpower at a fire or manpower at a fire secondly to go on these so-called inhalator and, and accident calls well two things happened uh, when, when uh, Quinn became fire commissioner uh, he um, energized the fire department by having a, uh, a band, a glee club, uh, uh, extracurricular activities. This drained manpower away. So he said, you know what, we'll send two engines <laughs> on every structural fire rather than one. Now that second engine was taking the, the role that the squads had been taking. Secondly, in, in Quinn's uh, uh, administration, when he came in, there were something like 16 ambulances. He increased it up into the 30s. So these special duty responses of going on inhalators and accidents were now being handled by two men in a Cadillac ambulance rather than five or six men on a on a squad. You know. And were so we glad? Yeah. <laughs> what would the what would the vehicle for the squad have been? Would it have been a when you say a squad? How would they have how would okay, they have moved? Okay. Up until 1940, there were open rigs, and uh, in fact, Bill, will you show your you have the logo right right here. Right here. Okay. See that? So it's we like what, like what we call a small fire engine. Yeah. It was it ba so basically. Would call that a fire engine. Yeah. yeah. And it was on a. Uh, a, a, a vehicle that would be similar to a pickup truck yeah. or so. We, uh, when White I say we, the yeah, uh, Howard Brenner and I restored one of the old squad rigs that had been uh, uh, retained by the fire department, and it's now in the museum. It's, it's our in logo. The museum, you can see it's here. Yeah, it's been completely restored. In 1940, they replaced them with four-door sedan vehicles. Okay. So. Uh, c because they were taking some long rides on on uh, on, uh, on special duties, you know, you can imagine dividing the city into uh, ten uh, different districts. You have a big, you know, you got two hundred, you know, s square miles. So we each squad we were was the furthest northwest. Yeah, and we ran out of uh, well, Lips and Ainsley is where we ended up uh, going out to O'Hare Field. Yeah, in in the middle of winter. Uh, rough, yeah. And and we couldn't get everybody inside. So where the heater ride. was. Yeah. So somebody yeah. had to be outside. Yeah. Well, was there any uh, firefighting uh, capability to that vehicle? Yes, yeah. they they had a. Uh, well, Chief, go ahead because you were on. Well, there. it's a, a, a monitor nozzle squad. Uh, you know, deck gun. Oh, like, deck a, gun. like like a gun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we yeah. had that. <laughs> And mm -hmm. and a few other things. So uh, it, it could support a in, a, in a fire. Yeah. 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 It, it carried, would take away uh, manpower. Uh, you know, yeah. you didn't have to have all of that manpower handling two or three hose lines. We'd put them into the squad, and one guy could handle that. Yeah. What was uh, it, what did they start putting put the winches on the trucks? Winches. It I didn't start until in the sixties. Yeah, because uh, well, they a were couple had, of them did. Yeah, we they didn't. had old trouble uh, called uh, burglar bars on how homes they people either died because of smoke inhalation mm, or mm -hmm. burning. Yeah, that was pretty rare though. But they did have the the, the acetylene cutting torch. They could cut those bars off and if they had on to. Later we had a saw, and, and there's ways and other and than yeah. trouble winching them. Still. Uh, Winching is faster than a torch because of the fact you got to bring the torch out and each one is. You know what? And that and that kind of thing is on Chicago Fire on the TV. Uh, we we never had that. We I never had that. I have never seen anybody use a winch unless you were pulling a. Yeah, we. Okay. The party farm we really had no use for a winch yeah. really. I, I what see were you thinking some of? vehicle, but not very many. Yeah. Yeah. Some yeah. Had civil it. Yeah. when when civil offense was was. Uh, uh, structured uh, back in uh, January 1st of 58 they had six heavy-duty rescue rigs they did carry a, a front-mounted winch on it but and some of our engine companies did too but it was 
you know, yeah, they, they, that's not our job really to to winch away vehicles. I mean, oh, I, I was talking about burglar bars because the people oh you know, trapped inside their own homes. No, you, we've got you know, other ways to get. Yeah, no, that. and you wouldn't be able. to. Yeah. I never heard of them yeah. doing that. I was going to say there was one other there's thing. No time to do that. No. Well, no. There's not, there's no. no. Even, even so, you know, if you come up with a torch, it takes time to get that torch over there and burn off half a dozen bars so they can you, be you're, you're gonna a lot quicker than using a winch and trying to get a rig close yeah. to it. Oh, the, yeah. Yeah, uh, and you, yeah. you're going to make a rescue from the yeah. inside. I was going to go ahead, John. No, I'm just going to say when the Eastland sank in 1915, acetylene torches must have been a relatively new piece it of equipment. Was. I think that it was, was, yeah. That can't have been around for many years. Well, yeah. The, the actually. Uh, most of that stuff came real popular during the Second World War because of the fact of building so many ships. And during the First World War, a lot of them were still what they call it iron ships, although they were steel actually. And uh, they were still, the Lusitania was, I believe, riveted. And so I think also. Titanic was riveted. riveted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it created problems. And, uh, and the uh, onset of welding helped it a lot because it's watertight or more watertight and the other problem with the old what they call iron ships was they used to use iron and the iron got brittle hmm. where steel was a little more flexible and I, I saw a movie once of them building a ship the old way and they used to get sledgehammers out there and beat the hell out of the metal to get it around the curves. Well, it's it's believed one of the reasons for the sinking of the Titanic was that there was substandard metal used in the hull of the ship, and that well, there was no, a settle. Yeah. Heard that yeah. one. Well, no. so was reason. that ever verified? Or it's, or it's one of those things that's hard to verify. But there's they've they've found yeah, samples of other metal metal that from was that time and compared it, and they they yeah. believe that the supplier used a substandard uh, type well, of steel for the well. They the also the was supposed to be unsinkable, and the trouble was well, that the they company had never claimed it was unsinkable. Yeah, I know. But they never. It was that was that was said by a trade publica yeah, publication. Okay. Said it said that the RMS Titanic was practically unsinkable. Was that the word practical? Prac and I always said, how would you like to, if you were a police officer, would you like to carry a vest that was practically bulletproof? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Practically bulletproof. Well, didn't yeah. they say that about the Iroquois Theater, too? You know, yeah. Well, the other fireproof. thing was that the fact is that if he hit the iceberg straight on, the chances of the tit uh, Titanic would have would been less. Almost zero. It, 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 it was designed for that kind of a collision. But the problem was he sideswiped it, yeah. and he put yeah. a big gash in there. And it popped a hell of a lot of rivets along yeah. the dash. You know, getting back to the Eastland, you can imagine. Yeah, you guys have sunk too many boats already. <laughs> 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 We're just you can imagine all of these people, and there was 2,500 of them with their families and so forth, uh, getting into their compartments, yeah. their their rooms, yeah, so that forth. Thinking they had a day of fun ahead. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. sure, and they're they're you know, getting ready to have fun and, and go dancing or whatever they, they, they were doing on that. And then this happens. Now, you get a couple of welders, whether they were, you know, the guys right there working on something else that came over. That took a while. Oh sure. You know, oh sure. Sure. Uh, then they were. They said they were knows? close by. They were very well, close. Well, by. even yeah. if they were close by, but they never. How do you know yeah. where there was, there was the the openings? Oh are sure, that yeah. Can they're, be just used. Blind. they're just blind. Yeah. They're just guessing and completely yeah. blind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Complete. So well, you know you can. It see comes under the heading of it was, it was better than nothing. Yes. They yeah. it was better exactly. Than nothing. It, yeah. Exactly. Well, they had no no shift drills. I believe at that time yet. Because uh, the Titanic, they had no ship drills at all, and consequently, when there was, if anybody yelled abandoned ship, the people didn't know what to do. In this case, mm. it happened. So I mean, the ship just rolled over. Yeah, right. yeah. There, there, there was no, no time to do no. anything in terms and of. And these yeah. people are are in their cabins, and turned now they're upside down. Yeah, they're yeah. Upside turned down. over. A and and also, you know, Al, this is this is a. Uh, it's in Lake Michigan. It isn't uh, in the uh, you know the oh, ocean or something. It, it, I don't know how long it took. Twenty to feet of water. Yeah. Yeah. Now how long did it take it to go over there? They were going to what St. Joseph, Michigan. They were going Michigan to uh, like a picnic grove, I believe. Yeah, or like a across uh, the lake and go yeah, to, uh, a couple of hours <laughs> or so. So you're not going to have a, a you know a drill. Uh, you have, no. Uh, you right now. You, every time you go on a boat on lake on the river, they go through a, a rig 
a rigorous uh, tell you all the life preservers are, how to get off the boat, and all this other stuff. This is just to go up and down the river, not even to go out. Sure. In the, you yeah. Know. It, but you wonder how yeah. many people really pay attention to it. Yeah. Well, it's just like the aircraft now. You got the uh, drill or the attendant there. Every t every time she comes in, there, it tells you what the life preservers oh, sure. are. The whole yeah. Bit. You know, yeah. and how many people pay attention because the fact that you've been on after three or four flights is all routine, yeah. but still, it's just noise. Yeah. A yeah. drill, a drill on a boat like that would either have to be uh, after they or a, as they were taking off, and then yeah. uh, notify sure. everybody, be up on the deck. Uh, yeah. uh, and so forth, or either that or before they got on. On the Titanic, I believe there was a there was a boat drill scheduled for the the, the afternoon, and they canceled it. There you uh, go. Uh, it was mm. canceled. It was going to be. Well, the never took place. Never took place. It sunk. The, the people on yeah. board there they had no idea what they were doing because they oh, no. claimed that they were supposed to have on board drills, and apparently they said. Remain oh. calm. Stay, stay in your bunk and your uh, cabin and all this other all stuff. And they were sinking. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh, pardon me, Alice. Time for another commercial break. We'll be right back after these messages of interest and importance. Hey, friends. Do you need an awning over your front, side, or rear door, or your windows? How about a canopy for your carport, or a patio cover over your patio so you can enjoy being outside in case of rain in the warm weather? All you have to do is call Awnings and More, and Raphael Bogus will drive over, measure up whatever you need, and go from there. You can call Awnings and More at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. So if you need an awning for your windows or doors, call Raphael Bogus at Awnings and More at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Raphael also installs hand railings for your front, side, or back steps. You must be safe when you go up and down the steps, especially in bad weather. So for awnings or handrails, call Raphael Bogus at 773-710-8403 or 847-890-1447. Call today for a free estimate. Now back to our discussion. One point I'd like to raise, uh, this might be a little marginal in the Eastland disaster. It's amazing when you see pictures of that ship what the capacity was, uh, 2,500, 2500. on a yeah, ship that size. that size. If that ship were afloat today, would they allow that m many people aboard? No, I, I, think I, I wouldn't think so. I think so. it was uh, overloaded at the time, too. Yeah. Uh, the ca capacity is how many people you can get aboard. <laughs> That's scary. How many can you fit into a can of sardines? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, about I sure would like to know who that but, is. Uh, yeah, there were there were many uh, funerals. I know uh, my my home parish is St. Mary of Chenstohova in Cicero. I call it the Cathedral of Cicero because if you drive that direction, you see the two Gothic towers. They're probably the most prominent feature mm. in the town. And I have seen pictures of of the multiple funeral services that were held, where they would have four or five caskets down the nave of the church, having because there were just so many who had died. That they they had to have they buried them by families rather than having separate funeral masses for each yeah. individual. There one one picture I'll never forget it shows the uh, uh, you know one of the uh, undertaker cars and they had they had four caskets uh, 
uh, right behind the driver, and then they had three piled up at right angles. Oh, there were seven. Yeah. They were carrying seven people out there. By the way, I want to make one other comment. And if anybody's ever read um, <coughs> any um, written uh, books, et cetera, on, you know, about the Eastland, and in one of them, and I was just commenting, I was talking to a, a field officer in Chicago, and he, we were both uh, commenting on the uh, Eastland. There was a comment in this book. It was by J. Bonsanga, who was uh, really sort of uh, uh, um, asked to write an article uh, in a book about the, uh, the, the... Evidently, there hadn't been a book by uh, about the Eastland disaster. And he, in there, says that someone had gone to the fireboat, which that was then parked at, uh, at the Franklin Street... Uh, bridge. You know, actually, there's no Franklin Street bridge, but yeah. uh, and and m mentioned something about the boat, and I don't know what he mentioned, but that it was unstable or can you do something about it? And I, I, I w w in checking the fire department orders, and and uh, and I found this, and it may still be true, when the fire boat is at dock, the fire officer is in charge of the boat. Once the boat leaves the dock, the pilot is in charge uh, of the boat. That's true. Like the captain of the ship. Yes. So I don't know what a fire lieutenant could not have given. Uh, first of all, they were a couple of blocks away. Franklin is, you know, west of Well Street, which is west of Clark Street, you know. So I don't know what the fire lieutenant, whose name was Sweeney, by the way, what he could have, uh, I I if he decided to respond, you know, and of course in those days, once you left the dock, you were I incommunicado. And secondly, what could the pilot do if he was then in charge when the when the fireboat is is uh, on on the scene? I don't know. I don't know. So uh, uh, that yeah. sounds like. Uh, and again, I don't like to read things that are not. Authenticated, Check. and you know, yeah. you know, who said this? Who yeah. said yeah. what? It's, it's always but hearsay. That's true yeah, it's that, yeah. That the once they leave dock, the pilot the pilot is, in, is charge into in charge because uh, there's no no way of of having that officer, lieutenant, captain, or whoever he is may not know what the hell. Right. Maybe, maybe no. it's the only time he's ever been on a boat. It's not well. navig navigation's not no, right. No, right. right. Oh, that's right. right. what rank you have. No. Yeah, pilot, he's in charge. Yeah. Yeah, that's why this pilot, uh, he has to be licensed. He has to know what he's yeah. doing. Yeah. Well, generally, though, the lieutenant can probably tell him where he wants to go. From there on, the pilot takes over. So right. it's it's a... The, the it's officer a will, will, uh, will instruct him where to go. Right. How will he get there is up to the pilot. Right. Yeah, and, and uh, maybe what the, what the crew is going to do. Yeah. Are we going to use a deck gun? Are we going to use a yeah. hand line? Yeah. Uh, what right. are we going to do? Yeah. Sometimes they would get off the boat and respond on foot, you know, go a block into the, to the fi like a fire yeah. at City Hall or something. Well, you know, the fireboat was due there, you know. It always reminds me of some of the old uh, movies you see on TV where a captain of the ship is in charge and an admiral comes aboard. Admiral's not in charge of the ship. No, nope. captain no. remains the captain yeah. of the yeah. ship. Yeah, remains in charge of the, uh, the ship. So, it gets to be. It's like know. Admiral Nol on the old voyage to the bottom of the sea. You had Admiral Nelson, who had four stars on his lapel, but you had uh, <laughs> captain was was actually the captain of the submarine right. itself. It. it, it uh, but the there's admiral never any doubt as to who's in charge. Yeah, the yeah. admiral can be in charge of the ship if he is. If the ship's turned over to him. Mm. But in general, mm -hmm. a captain is in charge of the ship. Of the ship. And but the captain has to take the orders of the admiral as to what that ship is supposed to do. Yes and no. Mm. Because not, if it's no, dangerous not. to the ship, then he, he can refuse. At least the new mm. ones, they, they can. I'm thinking of the Kane Mutiny now. Uh, <laughs> not quite. I don't, no, I don't no, think no. you. Uh, after <laughs> all, the admiral's the fleet commander. I he's in, he's in charge of, of all the ships in that fleet. But he, so yeah, they he all have to all have to take orders from him. He, he takes the orders, but the captain still has to decide how to get there. Well, you know, I would you think go. that an admiral above him would uh, huh. would well, uh, did, take him off. Didn't that happen? Yeah. What yeah. was, what well, was he the can't German? can't take him off of duty while he's at sea. 
the, what was it the was it the uh, what was the the German ship that was scuttled down in uh, Graf Spee? Graf Spee. Okay. They had an admiral aboard. Didn't they? Mm, no. no. Or, well, there was one no. that did have an admiral aboard. Yeah. That was the Bismarck. Bismarck. Admiral Lutyens was, Lutyens, was yeah. the fleet commander. Was the fleet commander. The but fleet consisted of two ships, the Bismarck and the cruiser Prinz yeah. Eugen. Yeah. And the Prinz Eugen eventually left, but Lutyens was, but there was no question that Lutyens was in command. Was I mean, in the command. captain, yeah. the captain did well, what Lutyens told him to do. Yeah. Uh, the Bismarck was sort of stuck. He couldn't go on uh, land. They couldn't go to sea because the sea was uh, blocked what? off by the uh, uh, English. So they sunk the ship. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was also an incident. Well, it was the, the Bismarck wasn't scuttled. The Bismarck was sunk by the British. The British sunk they the Bismarck sunk it, yeah. with okay. torpedoes and torpedo yeah. bombs. They hit it with everything, battleships. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, it was hit from the air. It was it torpedoed. It had, uh, it had a, uh, a steering navigation yeah, problem. Yeah, they, 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 the they hit the rudder. Hit one. the rudder. Yeah. 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 So so I was going to say there was a, there's a parallel thing in the fire department. The chief will back me up. You have situations where you have battalion chiefs and above who are assigned to a firehouse but there's a captain in charge who has the uh, the uh, not only the crew but the structure in his inventory so he is in essence yeah. the landlord we we're talking about it with squad 11 you know and that's exactly what we call him he's the landlord yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and they've had instances where chiefs would say i don't like this or and, and you know and the, the captain would say uh, you know, in essence, uh, I'm the boss here, you know. I mean, you had to couch it a little bit, you know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and if you want to make a change, put it in a journal and sign it. And I'll, mm. I'll, you know. But if not, my rules prevail. My work rules. Right. On Monday we do right. this, on Tuesday mm. we do that, you know. And uh, you're just a visitor here, you know. And uh, in, That's right. well yeah. in, the, in the Pacific, uh, I was re I've been reading a book about uh, the, the, f the four or five star admirals in World War II. It's called the Admirals Leahy, Nimitz, King, and Halsey. Halsey, who didn't become a five star admiral until after the war was over, it's a li little known fact that if, if you remember the movie The Cane Mutiny, that typhoon that that leads to the to the uh, the mutiny aboard the cane that's a real event that actually yeah. happened in mm. the pacific and halsey was the fleet commander in who sailed into that typhoon and it derailed his promotion to five star fleet admiral it happened in this had this the, the typhoon happened i believe in november or early december of 1944 and it was two weeks later that the promotions were passed out yeah. of General of the Army and Fleet Admiral. And for that reason, Halsey did not get his promotion to Fleet Admiral because he was under such disfavor mm -hmm. for having steered this fleet into this horrible typhoon. But anyway, Halsey uh, picked as his flagship the battleship New Jersey, which we're all familiar with because it was reactivated, it was reactivated for Vietnam, and then it Reagan reactivated it uh, in the 1980s. So he was the he would had had what they say the admiral had his flag aboard the yeah. New Jersey, but there was still a captain right. of the yeah. USS New Jersey who would be responsible for that ship, yeah. for the crew, for, the for everything else. Yeah. Halsey's up, up on the bridge, you know, directing the entire fleet, and he's kind of a guest aboard the New Jersey. Right. He just happened to pick that vessel as his was he doing flagship. the dance? Pardon? <laughs> was he doing a tap dance? Or I'm not sure if he was doing a tap dance or not. I think I don't know if Fred Astaire was was there or not that that afternoon. He oh, almost Fred Astaire. Yeah. yeah. It, that reminds me of the uh, tragedy of the Indianapolis when the war ended and uh, yeah. they were sailing back and they got it delivered the atomic bomb. Yeah. That was dropped on Hiroshima. Yeah. And the uh, Japanese submarine didn't know the war had ended and he let go of a sub of a torpedo hit the Indianapolis, and it, they called May Days in, but everybody essentially ignored it. No, I don't. It was the war was. It wasn't sunk. No, uh, the, the, war, the war, war was, was still, still on. on. War yeah. was still going on. It wasn't sunk, but the news of it was so overshadowed by the dropping of the atomic bomb. You see the newspapers. Oh. The headline is the atomic bomb, and then at the bottom of the page, you know, cruiser missing at sea, cruiser lost at sea. I yeah, the was war was still going on. No, the yeah. war was still going on. It okay. was yeah, the at the very end of the war because it delivered the atom bomb right. that, that was dropped on Hiroshima. Th that was a terrible 
snafu, really. Oh, with yeah. the sharks, was, all those yeah, men that were killed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, that was, a, that was also true of the uh, Pearl Harbor. A lot of it was ignored with the uh, Japanese planes coming in. They said, oh, we're, we're expecting a f- uh, B-17s. B-17s yeah. are coming in. And they shut down the radar and everything else, even though the radar operator indicated that uh, the problem was the B-17s were coming in from California from the opposite mm-hmm. direction the, yeah. the Japanese fleet was north mm-hmm. northwest of the Hawaiian Islands so, I mean it, it, it couldn't have been those B-17s no. but yeah. and, and that sort of thing happens a lot oh, sure. as oh, far as yeah. I'm concerned my, my uncle the guy I was named after was killed in uh, World War One, and the the peace had already been signed oh yes but that didn't hit him out in the yeah. machine gun nest that no. Bill was in and, yeah. and and that so uh now i would imagine everybody would have a you know everybody i, would, I, I, I wouldn't count iPhone. on that <laughs> i saw i saw a documentary about the fellow was doing a tour in in france of world war one and world war two sites in france and there's actually a, a british cemetery in which they have the British are buried and on one side of the cemetery is the first British soldier to die in the war in 1914 and directly opposite him is the last British soldier wow. who yeah, died right. on November the 11th he died early in the morning of November the 11th before the official ending before at 11 yeah. o'clock he died at like 9 o'clock in the morning and they have them Right across, across this little path yeah. that leads leads between yeah, them. Wow. That's that's yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah. over there, I, I know my uh, cousin's kid is going over there. He just retired from the Secret Service, and and he's, of course, he's getting into all of this. And uh, in Belgium, there's a lot of cemeteries. Oh yes, yeah, so much uh, of the house. So yeah. much uh, they, the they really, yeah. they really do it up. Yeah, you know, they they really. Uh, well, uh, not like us here. We yeah. don't seem to. to no, do we it don't appreciate it. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's you know Memorial Day is coming up, yeah. and that's yeah, a couple that's weeks. Direct, this weekend. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the this weekend, thing, yeah. The other thing is, they're still finding remains of soldiers that died because they just found one not too long ago, and they brought them in. Yeah, they still re- find uni- well, on this particular documentary. They still find unexploded shells. Oh, yeah. from yeah. the yeah. First World War. Farmers from still the first, from well, the, first the first world, world war. Around, they still yeah. find, and yeah. there's a there's a special team that then comes to dispose because it's routine for farmers to dig up an unexploded shell from the first world well, war. The, wow. the, the, the problem with that is there's so much corrosion on it; they get to be a little it's more dangerous. dangerous. Well, it's more dangerous. Much, sure, uh, sure. Yeah. And, uh, do, do you ever hear that joke about uh, um, someone is is revisits like Africa? You know where we had the uh, the fighting uh, there and and after the war and he noticed he he said you know he said before the war he said the men always went first and the women followed but Mm. I notice now that the women go first and the men follow he said is that a change in you know like democracy Someone said, no, no, we still have landmines out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was, that, 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 that's true. <laughs> that story goes also out to the Far East where the men, men used to go for first and the women, why does it follow so many mm. steps behind? I forget how many steps. And then after they had so many landmines out there, the women went first. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was standard procedure for the Red Army in World War II when they would approach a minefield to pull the tanks back and order the infantry to advance. Is oh, that right? That's because incredible. they felt foot soldiers were more expendable yeah. than, well, then, the than the they tanks. Could afford, they had an inexhaustible amount of men, yeah. but tanks were a oh, finite item. Yeah. They, the tanks were more precious yeah. than the soldiers. Well, one thing I don't understand is during the Second World War, they had several uh, methods to uh, explode landmines. One of them usually were attached to tanks. They had rollers in front. Yeah, flails. Yeah, yeah they called flails. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. that's the rollers. Hmm. The flailers were yeah. also there. Yeah. And I don't understand how come they don't use that. And uh, actually, the British used that. Yeah. I don't think that we they no. use it at D-Day, but I don't. British think had a whole group of tanks that were called funnies. They referred to them collectively as the funnies. funnies. Yeah. All these special hmm. gadgets, yeah. Yeah. Like say flails that were yeah. designed to beat the ground in order to explode the the yeah. lines ahead of the tank. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Going go to. Uh, the Middle East, there where all the fighting is going on now, they they don't seem to have any 
yeah. mine detectors or anything else. You every so often hear somebody getting blown up by a mine. Mm -hmm. Going back now to Chicago disasters, uh, it's right then that the Eastland caused the single greatest loss of life in a single disaster in the city, correct? It's, I think so. Not the Iroquois Theater fire. I think it might rank second. No, it, it, that's that's true. Yeah, yeah. I think you're yeah, right. Yeah. Iroquois. Kind of grisly how, how putting died, these ranking these in, things. Anyone know how many died in the Iroquois Theater? I, I mean, in the six hundred. Around six hundred one or so. Yeah. Six hundred is yeah, there again. Over eight hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah again, people the were. Thing. Then the Chicago fire, maybe 300. I mean, that's they, they not, don't even know because true. they didn't have the yeah, records. And, yeah. and people uh, left the city and never came back. Yeah. And so they, and they never buried that many, yeah. you know, 300 yeah. is a guess. Oh, they yeah. they, 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 the, the article expounds on that, that the sh Chicago fire uh, did not lo uh, lose that. We did not lose that many people. Lost so lost seen. No. We lost a lot of. Because it, it was relatively property damage. Yeah, it was a, a damage. slow, yeah. relatively yeah. Sl yeah. slow moving. We didn't lose a fireman at the Chicago fire. That's interesting. They, they had a lot of uh, personal property. In contrast, I think maybe Ken, you can address this some degree. I think a lot of us Chicago so called experts, we don't realize the significance of several major fires in the Chicago stockyards. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. The, the Maybe that's something. That the, the, the loss storage, of firemen lives, 1910, 1934. Yeah. Think, this think, is not often addressed. No. I think one of the reasons, I think we expounded upon that in one of our classes where we talked about how come the response wasn't as fast as it should have been with the Chicago fire. And they just put out a fire hmm. and the yeah. firemen were exhausted. Yeah. The and weekend the before, was yeah. pretty well yeah. exhausted to some degree. And then uh, the fire big fire started, so consequently he didn't have response time. You, 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 want, to, you want to know something, though? That That's false. I, I've done research on that. The fire department responded because uh, the closest three firehouses, and this has been documented, uh, they had uh, people on watch. It was nighttime. Okay. And Actually, why? From, from towers. From right? towers, yeah. yeah. Two of them had towers, yeah. and the other, they, they Watch didn't. Towers, yeah. Not just and city hall or county building. They responded. Right. They had uh, I, actually six fire trucks, two engines with the steamer and wagon, a hook and ladder, and a separate hose company. They were responding to the fire. I o always call it the, uh, the uh, I used the, the two streets, uh, DeCoven and Taylor, because it was mm. in the alley there. Uh, before uh, or at at the same time that the watchman was also sounding an alarm a mile away, but these companies were not, okay. you know, did they they responded directly to mm -hmm. that fire, you know? Yeah, okay, it's that misinformation. I, I know, and everybody yeah. everybody says that. Oh, you know, there was a, you know, he in fact, I had heard a lot of hoses were damaged in the previous fire, and they were sometimes short of hoses in the uh, and they the and Chicago yes, fire. and uh, and uh, and as Al said, the manpower too. They were mm -hmm. they were completely uh, exhausted, you know, yeah. Yeah. and uh, but no, we, I, we I have some uh, journals from. From that era, yeah. Well, the other problem you get into with all three of those uh, fires is nobody really had a head count. The Iroquois uh, fire or yeah. the uh, uh, Eastland and the Chicago fire, because the fact is that there was no census taken. No record was taken of exactly how many people were there to begin were, were with. The, yeah, no. yeah. Who was on on board? I yeah. think yeah. I think they came up with some of those because <coughs> of the tickets that were sold. Yeah. Here's a copy of that ticket. Well, the ticket was only a dollar. Well, What's that for the uh, for the Eastland? For the Eastland, oh, for the Eastland the was Eastland. really only a dollar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the also the fact was the Chicago fire. If you cremated somebody, you wouldn't find any remains. So consequently, you have that. And Plus if someone escaped, if he got out, he may have just gone home without reporting to anybody right. or mm -hmm. telling anybody that he had escaped. And if yeah. you didn't cross-check to see who was there, you wouldn't know. Well, and the other thing could be listed other, as missing. Other, uh, with the other fires, too, uh, with the Eastland and with the uh, Iroquois, some of the bodies were taken by the family before they were yeah. recorded. Yeah. So consequently, you didn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very hit and miss type of thing, but you, you knew approximately. That well, you know, you can see in the later disasters, for example, the Our Lady of Angels, there is a an yeah. exact total, and the same with the streetcar disaster, which is still oh, a yeah. record. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. Chicago learns from one big 
catastrophe, yeah. you know, uh, theater. Uh, what is the ship? streetcar? I'm, never, I'm not familiar okay, with the streetcar. Oh, yeah. I never heard of that. A, it got hit by a gasoline truck. From 1950. No, it, it, hit, it, it hit the it gasoline hit. truck. 62nd and State, uh, May 25th, 1950. 1950. It was a green horn. The car struck a gasoline tanker. Yeah. Tanker. It, it was, was a turn. Yeah. It was a turn there. And the problem was they had bars across the window to keep the hands inside. Oh. And the people couldn't yeah, get right. out. Couldn't and get how out, many right. people died? 33. Aboard the streetcar. Yeah. And, and the, dri and, and and the, the driver. driver of the truck. Of the gasoline truck. Yeah. What happened was it was raining that never night. Heard of this. Yeah. And a guy, you know, just wrote a book. In fact, uh, uh, I went to his, uh, he had a presentation. You didn't like the book that much, did you? Well, he didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> That's not so good. Uh, <laughs> I, and I, you know, you know, John, one of the problems, and, and uh, all of us have had it here because we consider ourselves historians. Once you get a certain uh, amount of knowledge, you're you become, yeah, you're dangerous. <laughs> you become sort of a critic, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then once you're a critic and you see something that's wrong, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, what happened was uh, the uh, streetcar was going north on, uh, uh, south rather, on State Street. And it, at 63rd Street, it goes under a whole series of railroad tracks, which are still all there. So it couldn't wade through it, so they were turning the streetcars around. They had a, a, uh, uh, a side track that they could go into, and then they could uh, reverse and then go back uh, back north I, again. I thought the streetcars were reversible. No. Was that the end of the line, 60, mm -hmm. 63rd? No, no, the streetcar was, uh, I don't know exactly how far south. Uh, later on, that line went all the way to 119th and Morgan, went through Roseland and et cetera. So, but they were turning the cars back because of uh, the, the 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 viaduct was flooded, oh, and the streetcars couldn't. Oh, oh mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and as in the course of turning, he, he struck this gasoline. Yeah, and, and it just turned. It, it mm. you know, as luck would have it, as they say, or bad luck had it, as the and they think that the the uh, motorman was going a little bit too fast, maybe twenty five or thirty miles an hour, and when he hit the switch. Et cetera. He actually went off the track oh, and hit that that yeah. tractor trailer truck wow. uh, head yeah. on, and it was a tanker with a trailer. So there are like two tanks. Two tanks, yeah. yeah. Wow. Although the second wow. tank vented itself properly, but it caused an explosion. Mm -hmm. You know, some people then they figured it was about sixty some people on the streetcar. About thirty of them got off, but uh, yeah. but uh, yeah. but what happened was it set. There were eight buildings on the east side of State Street that caught on fire, and that was the fire department's uh, 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 problem. Immediately, they couldn't get close to the streetcar to really, you know, to, to you know. And then, as so Al this said, thing is burning like an inferno. It's an yeah. Mm -hmm. all, uh, these houses uh, 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 actually they were all like two flats or two-story buildings anyway, maybe a store or apartment above. And the Did fire any people die in the, the home? No, the no, the fire department was there. And it happens around 6 o'clock in the evening, so the streetcar is really packed, et cetera. Yeah. At, at that, uh, and I was able to come up with the, uh, with the record from the fire alarm. Uh, we had a firehouse then at 60th and State, single hook and ladder, 6017 State. They called in the first alarm, which is not in the book, and they responded, you know, and then the chiefs came in, and, and it was the alarms were treated like it would have been an ordinary 411. They pulled a four on it, et cetera. But their problem was those eight buildings on fire in the streetcar. They hadn't been able to get close to it because it was an inferno. When they finally cooled all the buildings down, and you know, then as Al said, all the people that were in the streetcar that were below the the uh, the, the uh, uh, the uh, the glass, you know, the the uh, level of the uh, mm. of, of the street, they were all uh, cremated, cremated cremated below that line. And, and, and in fact, I I have pictures of it. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. What, firemen what are, are just standing below around. Below I don't yeah. understand. What well, you're when you're in a streetcar, you have you know glass windows oh, on oh, each oh, side. Oh, the glass of the windows. Yeah, okay. right. And then, as Al said, they had bars along yeah. there, so you couldn't stick your hands out or your uh -huh. head or something yeah. like that. Everybody that was cremated was below the the window line, etc. Yeah. 
And Why, it, were they double deck? No, 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 no. It was a regular Green Hornet streetcar. Oh, okay. the Green Hornet. Yeah, yeah. Hornet. That was on at right. that time. Was yeah. That oh, yeah. It's 1950. Okay, Green Hornets, yeah. I think the red, the red ones used to be able reversible. You know where you could have the motor and change. Yeah, they went one. I side to another like an, an yeah these yeah. W these were not the, oh, they the they yeah. no they they had a uh, you know oh. but the but the author uh, and uh, who's a teacher in the, for the uh, uh, public schools he said something about uh, the fire department did not follow proper procedure uh by responding immediately uh, which well that's and, and and waiting for an alarm from downtown i said what alarm from downtown? Yeah, how would you wait for an alarm from downtown? Yeah. Well, he was how talking about, about the fire alarm office. He was thinking <laughs> of the fire alarm office yeah. in City Hall. He said, what about the Englewood fire alarm office at 64th yeah. and Wentworth, which was around right the corner? There. And I worked there for four years. Yeah. They, Truck 30, you know, responded. Someone pulled the box at 63rd and State. And I showed him a response card showing the response. And uh, it went as a standard 411. And... Uh, of course, at that time, now this is 1950, the fire department had just put in the 12th ambulance. We had Mercury Siebert mm -hmm. ambulances in those days before we had Cadillacs. But 12 ambulances, you know, to cover the whole city, you know, they, but we had the 13 rescue squads too. So we had what we thought was good coverage at the time. Anyway, the bottom line is, Al, and the, the guy says, I wish I would have gone to you he he researched this thing for five years. The rest of it is his history uh, as far as the uh, procedures to be followed and and the uh, 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 follow up investigation was very well done. But he did, and that's the thing that Bill and I talk about. If you have a problem with the, with any question with the fire department, you go to the fire department. They're going to say, well, we don't know anything about 1950. Now we didn't come on a job. However, we have a museum, mm. and they have records. And I yeah. gave them a copy of the record, of the official fire alarm record, you know, so. Well, the other thing is about researching is you read one book, and you'll have another book that contradicts it. So, you know, well, I'm I mean, talking about really material Well, really contradict. Uh, it's the same way with politicians. Oh, well, yeah. they, they contradict. They take it down. Let's put it this way: a politician will say one thing one day and contradict himself the next. Yeah. Okay. Now for another brief intermission. You've been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians. Ken, was this a book on? How are the tires on your vehicle? Do you need motor oil? Or transmission fluid? Or power steering fluid? Or antifreeze? How about the wiper blades? Are they in good, sharp condition? Is the windshield washer fluid in your tank full? How good is your battery? Do you need re to replace light bulbs? Well, the place to pick up all these items is at Berkeley Auto Supply at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. Stop in and see Tom, and he will get you any part or supply you might need for your vehicle. He has every tool, part, and supplies you might need from the front bumper to the rear bumper, from the top of the roof to the bottom of your chassis. You can call Tom at 708-544-8350, and they are located at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. Tom's hours are Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and he's even open on Sundays from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's Berkeley Auto Supply, 5237 St. Charles Road, and he is just east of Wolf Road and west of Mannheim Road, about two miles on the south side of the street. Call 708-544-8350 for parts, tools, and supplies. It's Berkeley Auto Supply, 708-544-8350. 
and he's located at 5237 St. Charles Road in Berkeley, Illinois. Now, back to our discussion. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Escachoco here in our Meet the Chicago Historians, and this is our final half hour of our May edition here from the John DeVita Broadcast Center, and I'm here with Al Obitz, Ken Little, Bill Kugelman, and Rich Lang. So we've been talking about the, uh, the Eastland and other Chicago disasters. There's a great streetcar disaster that I was unaware of that happened in 1950? 1950, May, 19, May, 19, May, May, yeah, May, May 25. May, what was it, the date? May 25th. So we're very close. This coming uh, Sunday, I believe, yeah, will be wow. the, uh, their nec no, next Monday, next Monday Memorial yeah. Day will be yeah. the, uh, the anniversary of the, the 1950 uh, tragic streetcar disaster. It's still the, it's still the, unfortunately, the record for most people ever killed in a uh, trolley car accident well, in, in the nation. Many, again, tell us how many 33. Died. 33 people died. Yeah. It reminded me, you know, we're talking about disasters. One of the most well-known and tragic disasters of all time, of course, is the Hindenburg. And everybody's yeah. familiar with the oh, Hindenburg, yeah. probably yeah. much of it because of Herb Morrison's, Herb Morrison's radio yeah. broadcast on oh, WLS. The oh, the humanity, <laughs> the humanity of it. Oh, this is the worst catastrophe. But the interesting thing, of course, is there were only 30-odd people that died aboard the Hindenburg. I mean, by comparison to the Titanic, the Eastland, the Lusitania, yeah, the well, numbers I are think tiny. they could put in there. But it's the drama. It's <laughs> the drama. It's the drama. It's the, 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 the ship. It's the fact yeah, that it's on yeah. film. Yeah. It's an yeah. airship, which, of course, no long, they no longer fly airships no. with passengers of that nature. They, so, they, they but it's, it's, everybody's consciousness is aware of the Hindenburg. But in terms of numbers, only a little True. over 30 people died. Oh, actually, they're starting starting to fly uh, airships again. But the other one that Kenny liked was the one that was First National Bank. Don't oh, they? yeah, the uh, Goodyear oh, Blimp. The Zeppelin okay. that blew up in 1919. 1919, mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that's... Crashing into the... Yeah, yeah that's, that's a... Just well, a few days. Be my mother was born in January of 1919, and I think that airship exploded in in January of 1919. I, I, I don't know the month, I'm but I know I'm it was I'm almost certain it was January. But and I, I think it was the first of the what they call the Wingfoot Express. You know the uh, Goodyear the, blimp. Yeah, the, the I think what you told us I think was that. The bank had actually closed, and the women were some in their clerks. Uh, yeah, there were still yeah, some some. Cl I think maybe the bank was still open, but uh, uh, I don't. I, it it yeah. was I. Uh, for some reason, I always thought it was a, a w like a Saturday, but it was a weekday. Hmm. Yeah, and I and think uh, I think the accountants were there. I think for the most part, th at that time, the banks closed around three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. Oh sure, yeah. yeah. Three o'clock closing was standard for yeah. banks. And yeah. So I, I don't, you know, we don't know what time it happened, but the fact was. Primarily, women were killed in that. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, also too, because uh, I did research on that, the uh, closest fire companies were at a fire, and so the normal the, the response wasn't delayed much, but uh, uh, they were they were working at another fire. So uh, you know, uh, and can you imagine getting a, a run to, you know, you got a a. a Airship disaster. And, you, and you know, uh, there were over 90 people aboard the Hindenburg. So surprisingly, two-thirds two of the th people aboard the Hindenburg survived. And again, survived. looking at the newsreel, yeah, seeing yeah, you think that everybody hydrogen gas mm -hmm. bag mm -hmm. yeah. flaming, you would assume that virtually everyone everybody died. was. Yeah. But only about a third of the people aboard yeah. died. That is yeah. the you know, the, the, a lot of people, and, and this is on, on our, we're talking about records of people dying, uh, OLA. How many people died there? Uh, Ninety-two plus three years. Exactly. So, yeah. And and that's also always considered the worst school fire uh, ever. Yeah. Ever, sure. and it's not. And it's not. No. It's not. No. There, there's no, a number of. I got of the book, and yeah. and uh, uh, it's in Texas. Yeah. And there was like, oh God, you know, six hundred seems to. Yeah, six hundred in, in a school. The school oh, must the, have been a high they, school. Or they hit a a uh, gas main, a large gas main, Explain. and nobody got the kids out. Wow! Well, oh, yeah, nobody got it out. Roughly, and how long ago was this, blew. Bill? Uh, I, 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 I as far as fire exits or something like it. that. Yeah, uh, I, I believe it was like in the thirties. Still be wrong. Thirties or forties. Yeah. yeah. You know, the thing I worked off of, I, uh, I got to look at that book again. Right. Well, and, and, uh, that's right. Because, like I say, I'm very active with the OLA, 
but uh, I never heard of this. No. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, the thing about the Our Lady of Angels, it's in modern times. All yeah. of us yeah. here yeah. 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 were yeah. alive when well, it I happened. Remember, it. I was a kid. I remember that was that was vivid news. Oh, that oh was, that absolutely. Was, that was TV you cut know. into all programming. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, it's in modern times. All yeah. of us can remember it's it. It's like the Andrea you know. Doria. I remember as, as, as a, point. a very little kid. Kid, yeah. I remember the sinking of the Andrea Doria in the yeah. Stockholm. Well, the yeah. other one that uh, we're going to talk about disasters would have been the Halifax, Nova Scotia. The ship blew, ammunition ship blew up and took out about two thirds of the town or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah. And that they, happened in Texas. Too. In They're Texas too. In yeah. That's right. Texas. Uh, what, what was the town? Uh, well, I don't know. I can't think. You know. Yeah, I, it was, was in there, forty-seven, yeah. and you know that killed the entire. Um, it was a volunteer fire department. Killed the, every every member of their department had responded. I, I, yeah, I remember hearing. Remember, are you, you yeah. familiar with yeah. that? It was a yeah. ship yeah. that was on fire, and they Can't responded. Think of the name of that town? There was there was Texas a, City or something like that. Yeah. yeah, something like that. There was an act of German sabotage before the United States was involved. We're talking about the Lusitania before we got into the First World War. I think it was in 1915, where the ger- German agents. Planted explosives aboard aboard a ship containing uh, munitions that were headed for England here in the United States. Right. Wow! And it was an explosion. I think it was in New York, and the ship uh, the ship caught fire. There were several Americans who were killed, and the Wilson administration suppressed when they they learned that it was German sabotage. They they suppressed that because Wilson was committed to peace and he was okay. afraid peace that America. if the people had known that this act of sabotage had taken yeah. place, there would have been a demand for war. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the the fact that this was German sabotage wasn't learned until after the war was yeah. over. I never heard of that one before. So yeah. do, you, do you remember the incident at the Auditorium Theater? It was in 1917 where somebody I've heard set it, yes. a bomb in there. And yes, I haven't heard Fortunately, it. Michael Corrigan, who was the on-duty battalion chief, was in attendance. And to make sure that they were observing, you know, fire regulations. And uh, people kicked the bomb around a little bit. And he grabbed it (laughs) and put it under his coat, took it out to the sidewalk, snuffed it out, and then went back in and uh, told the people, you know, that uh, the emergency was over with. It was a minor fire and it could continue on. Uh, In fact, Madam Gally Kirchie was singing. And uh, he won uh, an award for that. Uh, what and, year uh, was this again, Kyle? 1917. 17, okay. And, uh, yeah. and, and uh, you know, well, so that was that would have been an act of terror, I guess we oh, would call sure. it today. No, you know? it would. Yeah. yeah. Well, you had the German agents that were landed on the on the East Coast in 1942, and they this intended to blow up bridges and yeah. tunnels and factories. One of them was from Chicago. One of them was from Chicago. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah, had, had lived in Chicago and then gone back to Germany. I think his parents were deported after the mm. war too. Yeah, yeah. He, he was. But you they know were what? All captured. They were captured and they had the tried, uh, sentenced, and executed within like two hours right. or something like that. Military tribunal. It wasn't a civil I court. I love it. it was I a love military it. FDR set up a military tribunal for them. Yeah. That's and they don't know where ju- they're. That we call that street justice. In yeah, Chicago. yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they don't know where they're buried. Whatever no. they no. they did with them, they and I wonder if anybody even bothered to read them their rights. Yeah, <laughs> the, no, <laughs> no Miranda. I kind of yeah. doubt that they bothered <laughs> reading them. No their Miranda rights. rights in those days. The, the fact of the matter was that wasn't a Supreme Court decision until relatively modern times. Yeah, so I, so I under. I'm, ju- I'm just. I'm just being. Just <laughs> making. Yeah, a, they, a, they, they trying to inject rights. a bit of humor yeah. into. Yeah. You know, another thing, the too. Miranda the Miranda decision in the 1960s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're talking about, just look at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That's, so you know, 19, known I think it was 1962. Yeah, and... 62? Uh, uh, well, the he's Miranda talking decision. about Miranda. Oh, I'm talking about the... Uh, yeah. Was, about the well, I was going to say, uh, there is another thing Chicago's known. I mean, you know, y- yeah. you've heard that there were gangs all, you know, all the major right. cities, but what's the, what's the, the big... Uh, 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 you know, Cap- the, the publicity Capone is, is Capone and uh, yeah. and uh, the St. Valentine Day Massacre, oh, yeah. which occurred on the near north side of Chicago. You Everybody know. knows that. You I know. think there's more books written about Capone than almost anybody else that I know of. Then there, I'm probably. probably right now uh, somebody's writing a book on him, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, the other one, there's a I was Al Capone's uh, great yeah. nephew yeah. or something, you know. <laughs> that was a book came out uh get capone was uh another one that came out a couple mm-hmm. years ago and but 
three of the members of the St. Valentine's mem uh, Massacre are buried out here in uh, uh, Irving Park Cemetery. Or are they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, have yeah. I like you mentioned uh, uh, before about John Cass on WLS. Yes. I like the way that he started his program with, oh, what was that, the guy that played uh, in the movie? Played That's who? The Chicago Way? Yeah. What, who was who said James Bond? Uh, Sean Connery. No, Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like the way he started. Yeah. Well, the well, that's, that's the Chicago. That's way. Chicago. <laughs> that's Chicago yeah. way. Oh, Walter Winchell was real good on. Uh, he sends one of your men to the hospital. <laughs> you sent yeah. three of his to the morgue. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Chicago <laughs> way. How about Before the we, we get Winchell. any further? I'd like. To uh, how about how about the Mickleberry uh, 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 fire? That was another great disaster. Yes. Right, Mickleberry fire. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, nor am I really. It occurs uh, at Southside Restaurant, six. perhaps. No, 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 it was a factory. Mickleberry sausage. You and know, the they people that make Mickleberry ham yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Forty ninth well, place. I just, roast, I just baked a Mickleberry ham yesterday. Yeah. Oh well, okay. So in honor of okay. the. When this happened in what year? Nineteen. Ah, uh, no, no. Uh, sixty two. Six oh, sixty two. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Hmm. and right. what happens there is that. Um, uh, it's a factory, and uh, uh, it's in operation, and it's right around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's only a block away from Tilden uh, High School, you know, mm -hmm. at 50th in Union. So the, the uh, firemen respond. Uh, they got people trapped in the building, people on the roof. They're putting up ladders, and it was a gasoline tanker truck. There we go again. It was in the alley. It was it somehow poured gasoline into uh, a container, uh, a wrong container, and it exploded. Yeah. And it killed yeah. killed four firemen outright, but injured a whole bunch and killed a bunch of civilians who were standing there innocently watching the fire, and all of a sudden this thing blows up on them. So, yeah. I was, uh, I worked, I used to work at, uh, off of uh, Pershing Road, thir uh, 39th and Laramie. And they were putting the, rebuilding the Pershing Road at that time, and they had a high pressure gas main at the time. Very, uh, not gasoline, gas. And you hear that thing whistle. And you, you know, if that thing ever lit off, it would have been the real, real problem. Yeah. But mm. that. They still have that problem today. Yeah, I know. But yeah. it's just to listen to it whistle. Yeah. Because of, of oh, the, yeah. Uh, when we, we had that so-called uh, uh, gas explosions on the near west side, we, we first time ever heard of the west side, and that was in 92 or so, and that killed, I don't know if it killed that up many in people, the, but... Up in the project. Well, yeah, um, yeah. Chicago, Milwaukee yeah. A area yeah. there, and... Uh, well, there was, there was a gas explosion. Yeah. There was about 40 or 50 fires there. Yeah. A few years ago on off of Oak on Oak Park off of uh, Montrose, took out a two flat, Ooh, and it that. just collapsed, huh. you know. And it, it didn't really do much damage to the houses next door. What was it, a gas explosion? Yeah, apparently, yeah. Apparently, yeah. Well, the other one that was, uh, you know, you know that, that funny turn that uh, Austin Avenue makes over by... Uh, North? No, it, on... Uh, by the Kennedy? No, it'll be uh, Lawrence Avenue. They got that, oh, that yeah. funeral home there. Well, a gasoline okay. truck turned over there. Oh so yeah, I know they had just one. Just yeah. a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. that's not that you long the ago. Damage to the house there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You look past yeah. the house and all the. That, was, was, that was that was Austin and Lawrence. Yeah, yeah. Austin yeah. Austin Austin over there. Some yeah. years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. The, this uh, this program today was supposed to be on the Eastland disaster, which uh, which we covered. And yeah, we sank it. Yes, we did. <laughs> and uh, this is the 100th anniversary. The people that run this, uh, uh, what would you call it? Historical uh, Society, Historical I think. Society yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a member. Out, yeah. out in Wheaton, I think. Are they having uh, uh, the anniversary commemoration a few days later? It's July 24th, 25th, and 26th. And on the 24th, uh, from 1 to 2 o'clock, they're having a public ceremony, which is a river walk ceremony open to the public. Yeah. Saturday, they have 
uh, all day long from 8.30 until 5.30. Uh, they are having different uh, things, uh, a luncheon, a public ceremony, a dinner break, and uh, they're also having a, a cruise, which uh, uh, is kind of where, odd. Uh, that, where, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think, where is this? Is this down at, at the location, like Clark yes, Street Bridge? Yes, this is at... Uh, uh, buh, buh, buh. Let me see. All right, to break in there for a second. Their 100th anniversary of the Titanic, they had chartered two ocean liners. Oh, yes, yeah. To go t the route of the uh, Titanic. Yeah. And I always thought that was sort of strange myself. But it doesn't know. say here, Ken. There's so, uh, there's so much interest uh, in uh, the But Titanic. it's got to uh, be right where, to right where the boat. Yeah, yeah, there's no. a Titanic there's museum out in DuPage County. And there's also there's oh, is there? Oh, yeah. There's this, they have a historical society, I think, in Wheaton, uh, where they have artifacts and memorabilia. Yeah. And it's the headquarters of this Eastland Memorial. Well, this uh, is, and they have Eastland uh, uh, artifacts there too. And then this continues on the Sunday, July 26th, uh, and uh, with families. And uh, this is uh, at nine o'clock until one o'clock, and and by <coughs> families they mean families of people that were uh, the families of people that died in they the Eastland, or yeah. people that yeah. uh, uh, were actually got out of it. I we're mean, we're going to have people a did get out. We're going to have uh, a historical s a ceremony in Cicero in July because so many of the dead were from were from our town. Were from, yeah. And we have a historic marker at the site of the old Western Electric plant. We have a large plaque that uh, tells oh, you the do. story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we de okay. dedicated a few years ago. We're going to we're probably going to take replicate it and put another one right on the grounds of the town hall because people don't go. To, it's, it's not as well traveled where the old Western Electric plant yeah. is. We're going to put it on the grounds of the town hall so more people will... Do they still call that the Hawthorne Works? The, the old Hawthorne Works, right, yeah. Right. Yeah. Is the tower still standing? I one of the towers. The one, the one that was on the corner was that everyone thinks of was demolished because it was part of the, the factory and oh. office combine. I was there, I think it was in 1986 when they dynamited the tower because yeah. they said it was structurally you could not preserve the tower once all the adjoining okay. structures had been torn okay. down. But there is a tower. There was another tower set in uh, on the property, which was the headquarters of their fire department and their police force. That tower is still okay. there. So that this is, uh, uh, this is kind of a shopping of center. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a shopping Kind of odd somewhere. with this ticket. It's uh, uh, the ticket, the, the people that ran this and that owned the, uh, uh, the ship is the Indiana transportation company and uh this ticket says a lake excursion and where's, picnic. This, where's all this taking place and you know what for a dollar a lake excursion and picnic can you imagine what that would be today sure. it's uh you know, about 20 i'm gonna say five, probably 20 about 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 bucks today it's 20, probably 25 dollars at least, oh, that's at least no, it's it's be no no for a no, picnic? no no the dollar has it's depreciated about oh, food okay. they're talking about food okay and the maybe. price of an excursion on a, on, on a ship like well, that. I know. I'm just saying the equivalent of a dollar in 1915. Oh, it's it's. Uh, you can go on the uh, one of the ships there. They go out out the lake. It's about fifty dollars a person. Yeah. Yeah. Still a good price. That doesn't mean that yeah, it's food. equivalent to whatever they were going to yeah, do. Food, I don't. Because yeah. you're you're going to get food and everything served. We're here. I think. Yeah, lousy food, but it's side of point. Yeah. I wanted to take a few minutes before our show well, ends because we've been we've been talking about uh, the Eastland and other uh, civil disasters. But well, we're coming up on the Memorial Day weekend, and I thought we should take just a few minutes because there's been some historic uh, commemorations recently of, of those who died in the defense of our country uh, just this a few week, few days ago, really. Yeah. Uh, May the 7th and May 8th, we marked the, uh, the 70th anniversary of uh, VE Day, the end of the war in Europe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, World War II ended in Europe when the, the German... High Command surrendered to General Eisenhower and the, uh, the Allies uh, at a, a small schoolhouse in the French city of Rems right after midnight on the 7th of May, 1945. But the Soviets insisted that there be another surrender ceremony the next day at which they could preside. So they did it all over again on May the 8th in Berlin with Marshal Zhukov presiding at the mm. surrender. 
Dwight Eisenhower was invited to attend, but he declined. He was not going to go to a ceremony that would be conducted by a man who, who was, whom he outranked because Eisenhower was the supreme commander in the West. Yeah. Where I just came across this information where Zhukov was merely an army group commander. He wasn't equivalent to Eisenhower. People sometimes think of Zhukov as Eisenhower's equivalent, but yeah, he wasn't. He, wasn't. he was simply no. commanding one Soviet army group, and there were other Soviet army groups with other marshals in charge. So as a result, Eisenhower declined to attend. Hmm. But uh, last month in April, we marked the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War, the surrender of uh, Robert E. Lee to U.S. Grant at Appomattox. And sometimes you will see the surrender took place at Appomattox Courthouse. And tourists go to Appomattox, and one of the first questions they ask is, where's the courthouse? Where's the courthouse? Well, the courthouse was long gone. It wasn't even there at the time of the surrender <laughs> ceremony. But somehow that name stuck on the community. So the town is known as Appomattox Courthouse, even though there ain't no courthouse <laughs> there. <laughs> so if you ever go to Appomattox, don't waste time asking where the courthouse yeah. is. But, of course, it was, it was in, in April of 1865. That, in, in a that, private uh, home, of course, it took place. Yeah, and so in, the, in the McLean house. McLean, and, and, that's right. Uh, Wilmer McLean, and you may know the story that, that he owned uh, a, f a farm that was right near where the first great Con uh, conflagration took place, the Battle of Bull Run, and because of the damage to his property, he moved deeper into Virginia, and then it was at his home that Lee and Grant chose as the site for their surrender. So in later years, McLean used to say that the war began on his front lawn <laughs> and ended in his front parlor. <laughs> so they, they used his home as the place where, where Lee and Grant met, and of course Grant gave very generous terms to the uh, to the south at the time of the surrender we're also marking the uh, the anniversary of the first world war it's the hundredth anniversary of world war one which began in nineteen fourteen the united states did not enter it until nineteen seventeen but it was raging in europe and even even the war of eighteen twelve earlier this year in january we marked the anniversary of the battle of new orleans oh. which was the last engagement the last important engagement of the war of eighteen twelve the two hundredth anniversary which happened which after because yeah, of lack yeah, of the, the and, but that's that's another one of these little sidelights of history. Yeah. I mean, you read in the history books; they always say that it happened after the war was over. Well, not really, not quite, because not quite. the Treaty of Ghent had been signed on Christmas Eve, eighteen fourteen, in Belgium in a city called Ghent. But it provided that the war would not actually end until that treaty had been ratified by the United States Senate. Because it, we're having oh, this debate okay. right now with Obama and Iran treaties are not actually official until it's been ratified by the Senate and that had not taken place yet so technically the war was still going on it was it was still going on simply that a treaty that would end it in the future had been signed uh, yeah. but the news had not traveled they yeah. weren't aware that the treaty had been signed and it was a very decisive victory by General Andy by God Jackson <laughs> yeah. in New Orleans and Jean Lafitte's Pirates, there if you go. remember the great movie, or, The Buccaneer. Yeah. And it was very important because it ended the war on a high note for the United States Army. Our Army hadn't performed very well in some of the earlier engagements, and they delivered a decisive defeat to British regulars who had fought Napoleon and had been sent to the New World to teach the Americans a lesson. And they were the ones that, that came in on the receiving end of it. So I only mention this with Memorial Day coming. Mm -hmm. We've got anniversaries of World War II, World War I, Civil War, wow. and, of course, even the War of 1812. So I think we ought to bear in mind that uh, it's always important to uh, honor all of our veterans, all those who have served and fought and died in defense of our country. Yeah. And uh, Memorial Day, since it was separated from May the 30th, when everyone knew it was Memorial Day and became a Monday holiday, tends to become just the beginning of summer and a time yeah. for picnics and ball. And that's fine, picnics and baseball games and everything are fine, but it's also good to remember the purpose of honoring exactly. those who defended our country. You know, yeah. Something that uh, uh, President Bush, I know, signed was that any veteran that uh, uh, instead of putting his hand over his heart should salute. salute. Yeah. Yeah. salute. And last Wednesday... There was a, a memorial service out in Addison, Illinois, uh, for Police Week. Mm -hmm. It's uh, May is Police Month, and uh, I attended uh, because of my son and, and, and gave a talk. But when when they came in to set the 
the flags and, and uh, uh, to sing the national anthem, a lot of guys were saluting. And that's the first that's time the I've seen that. Yeah. And that's uh, exactly. But a lot of people don't know that now. Yeah. They, they yeah. just it hasn't gone around that long. Yeah. Well, the other yeah. thing is uh, Andrew Dunning, who Dunning is named after, the community of Dunning, Sir, three turns in the uh, Civil War. He went in first as a uh, foot soldier, second as a non-commissioned officer, and third time around as a commissioned officer. Came back wounded and uh, settled here. By the way, mm -hmm. what was the Eastland? Who who was Eastland? I don't know. Does, Does anybody know that? Origin? Yes, the no, Eastland. No, no. I, I suspect it's just one of those generic names. I don't. I don't no, think it's it, not. I don't, I don't think it was, a, Named I don't think it was after a person. Uh, yes. No, I'm not, I'm he not was a U.S. I, I forget now if it was a senator or a representative. And, uh, well, that's, there, was uh, a, there was an Eastland much later. There was an, there was an no, Eastland in the was, Senate much later. Not at the time. Named, of the, not the time this of was the South. Named yes. I know there was a Southern the senator. Yeah, Eastland. Southern, yeah. from. But that was in my yeah. time. I remember yeah. James yeah. Eastland. Yeah, that's, right. That was in the right. 50s. And Might have been this guy's kid. I wonder. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> One other little anecdote before we close. I saw something interesting today when uh, I was having uh, breakfast. I saw an old episode yeah. of, of Father Knows Best. Uh oh. <laughs> and they were having a, a, a ceremony in the in the uh, the town center, and there was a flag behind the podium, an American flag, and I noticed that it looked kind of odd. It was stars. a forty-nine star oh, 40. flag. It was the film. It was filmed in nineteen sixty. It was the last year Father Knows uh -huh. Best was on. The 49-star flag only flew for one year, year from the right. 4th of July of 1959 right. until the 4th of July 1960 when Hawaii entered as the 50th there state. So it was unusual. It had seven, ro seven rows of seven stars, and they're staggered. And I remember we had one. I, ha I have one at yeah. home, a 49-star flag. But it was I one of maybe one of the very few times on film or in, in, on television that you can see a 49-star flag, flag of the United now. States. Well, yeah, they, one year. they add the, uh, any state enters, the new stars entered on, on the, the 4th of July. July. And it was decided that, that Alaska would one come in part. officially in 1959 and Hawaii would come in officially on 1960, mm -hmm. even though they were both named as states in 59. They were both admitted to statehood in 59. Okay. But it was done in such a way that Alaska would be first and then Hawaii would be second. Will we ever have more than 50 states? I well, Puerto Rico's up there well, for grabs. That's, oh, that's actually, the, the well, president says we only have 47. There's a Star Trek episode in which they say, oh, 54 stars. 54 Ooh, stars on the American flag. What were they counting? And the fellow yeah. says, that dates it to between uh, 2061 <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Captain Captain Riker on, on Star Trek. C California has split up into two go. different... Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. They, they've talked about that a few times and also about Texas. Yep. Texas has the right to subdivide into f as many as five states. They're talking about on Mexico own, being one of our time. states, too. Pardon that? Uh, Mexico. No, so. Mexico. When, Tex <laughs> when Texas entered the Union, it was an independent republic, and one, right. of the, one of the points of the agreement was that the Texas legislature could, if they decided, subdivide the state into as many as five separate states. But I don't no. think Texas wants to Sounds be subdivided like into West territory. Five states. No. Well, the, the uh, well, it's, the show's over with already. Uh, oh my! Not, not until the announcer Texas. says. So. Yeah. Thank you, John. We wish to thank Kevin of Jack FM, WRHS eighty nine point seven FM, for broadcasting our shows over the Ridgewood Radio Network. Recordings of previous Meet the Chicago Historians programs are available for your listening via the internet at www.windycityhometown.com. And we want to thank the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, John Zakanda. On behalf of everyone associated with our Historians program, thank you for listening. This is your announcer, Rich Lang. So long until next time. And this is John Kachoko, and I've enjoyed being the substitute host for Jack Red Ryan here at the John DeVita Broadcast Center. I hope Center. they're feeding him in that place. And, and Jack, keep your back to the wall. <laughs> and if they're feeding him, but they're going to realize that they're better off getting rid of him. Than, uh, <laughs> Have a blessed Memorial Day. Yeah.
You have been listening to Meet the Chicago Historians from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Monday, May the 18th, the year of our Lord, 2015. This broadcast was produced by Jack Ryan, directed by John DeVita, and the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network is Mr. John Chicano. Until next time, be safe and thanks for listening.